Representative Ackerman. Representative Agello. Present. Representative Baginski. Representative Felix. Present. Representative Hull. Representative Kennedy. Present. Representative Knight. Present. Representative McGaw. Present. Representative Nardone. Uh, present. Representative Newberry. Here. Representative Shawcross Smith. Present. And Representative Tansy. Present. Ten present, five absent. We have a quorum. Thank you. Welcome to the House Committee on State Government and Elections. Today is Monday, March 1st. We have 15 bills on the calendar. House Bill 5285, 5290, 5421, 5422, 5430, 5486, 5596, 5597, 5598, 5599, 5600, 5635, 5640, 5748, and 5757. I'll entertain a motion to hold all of those bills for further study. Second. So moved. so moved, Representative Kennedy. Moved by Representative Kennedy and Representative Knight. Second by Representative Newberry. Clerk, can we have a roll call vote, please? Chairman Shanley. Yes. First Vice Chair Messier. Second Vice Chair Corvese. Representative Ackerman. Representative Agello. Yes. Representative Baginski. Representative Felix. Yes. Representative Hull. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative Knight. Yes. Representative McGaw. Yes. Representative Nardone. Yes. Representative Newberry. Yes. Representative Shawcross Smith. Yes. And Representative Tansy. Yes. The ayes have it. Thank you. The first bill that we're going to look at tonight comes to us from Representative Geraldo, House Bill 5748, an act relating to education, criminal background checks of volunteers and interns. It would require state and national criminal background checks for persons volunteering or interning at any elementary or secondary educational institution. It would also waive fees for background checks for employment with salary of less than $40,000. Representative Geraldo, welcome, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chairman Shanley and members of the committee. <clears throat> I wanna thank you all for taking the time to have me here to discuss my bill. Um, to start, I'd like to note that I'll be working with uh, Legislative Council on the concerns that the ACLU posted uh, or posed in their written testimony opposing the requirement of passing a state and federal background check in order to volunteer or intern at a school. Um, and I certainly would invite the ACLU to be part of the discussion as well. Uh, while I believe schools should have some level of protection about who is allowed to be near our most uh, precious asset, our children, I wholeheartedly agree that we need to ensure equitable and expansive opportunities for parental engagement, especially uh, for those in BIPOC communities that have certainly been over-policed and uh, communities with immigrants and undocumented families. And I think it would be worth taking a look into uh, what is deemed as a disqualifying event and the factors behind them. Um, as a former teacher, please trust me that I want our parents to be engaged and involved. My whole goal was actually to make it easier uh, and not make it more complicated. Uh, so I look forward uh, to anyone uh, looking to work, uh, looking to make this legislation better. My intention, my original intention behind H5748 was to actually make it simpler for parents uh, to volunteer and for low wage workers to get their BCI. In a simple sense, parents and volunteers shouldn't have to pay to be able to help out in their classroom. And I think that's the sentiment that the ACLU was um, also capturing and I wholeheartedly agree with. We all know the benefits of having parents engaged in their child's learning and the school community in general. This bill aims at making that simpler by waiving fees for those looking to do so. And also again for low wage workers, so whether it's a part-time staffer, a crossing guard, bus driver, college intern, uh, they shouldn't have to be burned with the cost of paying for a background check that costs 
whether it's five dollars for the state background or thirty five dollars for the federal background and with that said mr chairman i want to thank you and the committee for your time and consideration of this bill thank you any questions for representative geraldo representative knight uh thank you representative geraldo if um if we waive the fee uh, who's the fee go to does that who would pick that up uh I would say that that's a, a, a concerted effort on the state's part to uh, eat those fees for parents that want to volunteer in their child's classroom. But the, uh, so that's where I'm confused. Are you aiming the fee waiver at uh, parents, like volunteers, or are you aiming it at people who are going to be employed by the school? Uh, my intention is that it's both, for both categories. Uh, all right. And you would have the state pick that up? Yes, sir. All right. Thanks. Representative Newberry. Thank you. Just do we have any idea how many people this would apply to if this uh, passed? That's a great question. I don't have those numbers yet, but I'd be happy to get those and report back to the committee. Any further questions, for Representative Geraldo? Hey, we have two witnesses signed up, uh, Steve Brown from the ACLU. Is he available to testify via phone? Good afternoon, Steve. This is Evan Shanley calling from the House Committee on State Government and Elections. We're discussing Representative Geraldo's bill, House Bill 5748. You have signed up in opposition, and you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair and members of the committee. Um, as Representative Geraldo noted, uh, we have submitted written testimony um, expressing in more detail our opposition to this bill. Um, it's important to note that right now um, state law does authorize uh, or require um, uh, state criminal record checks for volunteers in schools. Um, we're, we've had problems with that. We've actually had to file a lawsuit over a school that banned a parent from uh, volunteering at uh, her child's school because of a past criminal record. Uh, we think that expanding the, uh, the criminal record check requirement, as this bill does, to national criminal record checks would uh, make it even harder for parents, to, uh, for some parents, uh, to participate, uh, particularly parents who have had problems with uh, criminal records in the past. Um, we think it would have a, a really devastating impact on immigrant uh, parents um, who will not, for understandable reasons, want to be giving their fingerprints um, in order to volunteer at their child's school. Um, so uh, we think that uh, the current statute is, is more than sufficient. Uh, and so for those reasons, uh, we oppose passage of this bill that would, that would expand the current uh, criminal record check requirements. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions for Steve? Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Next witness we have signed up is Ryan Holt from the Attorney General's Office. Is Mr. Holt available? Good afternoon, Ryan. Evan Shanley calling from the House Committee on State Government and Elections. We're here discussing Hi, Representative Chairman. Geraldo's bill. Um, you're signed up with no position on the bill. Uh, welcome, and uh, what Thank do you have you. to say? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if, if it's helpful for you, I'd be happy to combine my testimony on, on this bill as well as 5486, or I can you know, do them both separately, whatever is easier for you. That's, that's fine. You can do that as well. I'll just uh, put House Bill 5486 in play, and then uh, Floor Manager Edwards will be in later to discuss it. It would require okay. all applicants for employment with the Department of BHDDH or any of its licensed facilities or programs to have the Attorney General's Office conduct their mandated nationwide criminal records check. So you can discuss both of those bills now, Mr. Holt. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Ryan Holt, the Director of Legislative Affairs for Attorney General Morona. Um, as I indicated, we don't really have a position on you know, the merits of this bill, but wanted to note a couple of things, uh, just because our office and our operations are implicated. Uh, one, um, for each bill, we would just need to, and I know you had asked the uh, sponsor of 5748 a question on this already, but we would need to 
uh, have an assessment on what the impact on operations would be for the office. Uh, currently, we process, in, in at least normal times, around 120 national background checks a day, uh, 300 state background checks a day, uh, around 15 fingerprint requests a day, as well as processing uh, permits for uh, folks who seek AG, uh, CCW permits, uh, security guard permits, as well as that um, the, the line that you come into in our Cranston office is kind of the uh, the first line for, for folks who seek to, to potentially engage with our consumer unit, as well as filing for expungement. So it's a pretty busy and active area. I'm told we, we see uh, upwards of you know four to five hundred uh, Rhode Islanders a day on a normal day, which is which is great. Um, and they uh, currently move through there uh, pretty quickly because our, our staff uh, works uh, very hard and very 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 efficiently. Uh, but I'll note that as the General Assembly you know, continues um, to to update the the state national background check requirements. Uh, the number of, of checks that we have to do is, is steadily rising from somewhere around about 10 or so percent a year, but our staffing uh, has not really changed there. We have, uh, I'm told, nine dedicated staff uh, there uh, on, on both shifts, uh, I think four on one shift and five on another. Um, but so we just want to be able to assess that, uh, the impact that, that both of these would have. Uh, one other item uh, to note, that any time we have to change uh, or uh, authorize a new national background check, that language has to be vetted uh, through the FBI in order to um, authorize us to run those checks. Uh, so I would ask, um, you know, that if uh, the committee uh, is seeking to either, you know, advance either bill uh, or sub A, either bill to keep us in the loop on that so we can engage with the proper folks down at the FBI uh, to get these uh, get these things looked at in a timely manner before the legislature uh, passes the bill. Um, a specific point on each bill, one on 5748, uh, while I think it is the, the, uh, the fee waiver may be a, a noble uh, thought, uh, I wanted to note for the committee that we uh, are mandated by the FBI on, on collecting that fee for national background checks. We pay them directly. We do not have uh, the ability to waive that fee. Um, on 5486, uh, the question around whether an employer has uh, 250 employees or not, uh, just trying to figure out how our, our office would, would know what that is um, when, when a person comes comes to us again, we can kind of try to figure out a way to work work on that with you all if you're if you're looking to move this bill forward. Uh, but just wanted to to know that we currently wouldn't have a mechanism other than just asking someone in good faith um, how many employees uh, the company that they work for has. Um, so with that, uh, happy to to work with the committee and with the sponsors if need be, and um, can take your questions if you have them. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Holt? Chairman? Uh, Rep. Kennedy. Rep. Kennedy. Uh, I'm curious, Brian mentioned we have state background checks, we've got federal background checks. It sounds like there's, uh, there's a whole uh, different variety of, of different things that that office does. What does a state background check cost versus a federal background check, since Ryan mentioned that the FBI does require for the federal one that money be uh, brought forth in order to pay for that. Yeah, I believe a state check representative is five dollars, and it's thirty-five for the national check. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Holt? Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have a great night. That concludes testimony on House Bill 5748. Next, we will move to House Bill 5598 from Representative DeBone. First Vice Chair Messier, would you like your votes recorded to hold the bills for further study? Yes. Yes. Representative DeBone, welcome. Chairman. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thanks for having me. Uh, Bill H5598, uh, the Department of Business Regulation, Automobile Wrecking and Salvage Yards. This is uh, the third or fourth year I put it in, uh, and it's, it's very simple. Uh, you have uh, salvage yards who have all their equipment and machinery to operate, and they have uh, very big overheads. Uh, we require them to be licensed, to have insurance, and before they turn the key, th there's a, uh, a big cost for them to do business. Uh, then there are the individuals who buy a vehicle here and there, they dismantle it, sell it for parts, and make a few bucks. And there's a saying that if you treat it like a hobby, it pays like a hobby. If it's a business, it pays like a business. And then there are the people who fall in between, who do this on a regular basis, but they don't, they're not licensed with us. They're sometimes uh, going in unmarked tow trucks. And they have a business, but it's not legitimate. And so therefore, it, it, it hurts those businesses that we are requiring to operate above the law. Uh, what this bill intends to do is make sure that any business that's operating in that manner is fined and either discouraged from continuing that practice or to legitimize. And that's what this bill 5598 essentially uh, aims to do. Any questions for Representative DeBone? Representative Newberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's not really a question. Um, I just learned something for the first time today that we that we licensed we like we force people to sell junk cars to get a license to run a business. If we're going to do that, this bill makes sense. But I would suggest that that's one of the many, many, many things we force people to pay licenses for in this state that drives up the cost of business that we shouldn't be bothering to do. So I'd actually rather just get rid of the licensing requirement and let people sell junk cars if they want to sell junk cars. So I'm not opposed to the bill. I get it. But this is going in the wrong direction. Like, we, how many things do we license in this state? I'm not in general. Like, that's uh, everybody needs a license to do anything in this state, which is why our economy is terrible. Thank you. Representative Knight. Uh, Rep, is there a um, some sort of story that caused this bill to come into existence? I what, mean, what what got you going on it? No, just being involved in, in the community, you know, you see people hustling, trying to make a few bucks, and um, I, I, there's no shame in that. Uh, but then you see people who do that on a regular basis, and then I see that uh, here we are trying to do the business of the people, and we fall short constantly financially. Uh, people expect us to do the same, but our hands get tied year after year. And so those dollars begin to add up in and, and one direction or the other. In this case, it's something that uh, and I agree with Representative Newberry. I think that sometimes we could cut the cost of business, but if businesses are expected to do this and we haven't done that yet, and it's revenues that we need in order to operate because our expenses uh, require that, then it's only proper that those individuals who are, uh, who are operating a business that's not legitimate, they pay. The other part of it, the other part of it um, is because uh, I had a constituent about four or five years ago reach out and they told me that they bought a part off of somebody, I don't know, on Craigslist and then they couldn't get in touch with them anymore. So there's no warranties either. And, and that's, it's more of a consumer protection bill in that sense. Any further questions for Representative DeBone? Representative Nardone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, have you t t talked to any of these people that are supposedly doing this, like junking cars, scrapping cars illegally? Or, uh, because most of the people that I know that are doing what you're saying they do, very low-income people just trying to make a few bucks on the side. And as far as like selling parts on Craigslist, I had a, I had a sob. I, I potted out. I mean, I didn't feel as though I was doing anything wrong or anything like that. Um, so have you taken that into consideration? No, oh, absolutely, uh, Rep Representative. I mean, like I just said, I said there's three types of people, right? Uh, three, three. There are those who have the big overhead. There are those who grab something occasionally and make a few bucks. The analogy that I made about the hobby and the business. And there are those who are operating a business, but they're not registering it, and they have no liabilities. And they also can't, they have no guarantees either. And so uh, if I don't, I don't mind someone's hustle. When I was a kid, I used to cut hair you know, when I was 13, 14, 15. 
I didn't have a license, but I'd, I'd, I'd cut one person's hair a week or two. Um, the Department of Health wasn't coming after me. But if I was doing that on a regular, or if I had a, a, a storefront open or traveling and you know, a lot of these barbers, they have to take a licensing test, you know, with the biology and all that stuff to make sure they don't hurt anybody in between, right? I'll get someone sick. It's only fair that if we are requiring this in the different areas, that people abide by the law until we change it. And so uh, if somebody's out there making a few bucks, that's, again, I, I, I respect the hustle. What, what I don't respect is the fact that there are people out there who are paying big overheads. They're paying taxes, they're paying insurance, they're paying workers' comp, they have to buy machinery, maintenance, you name it, the list goes on. And I don't think it's fair to them either. So, and, and, and the money that they're paying, we count on. We, we are literally knocking their door down if they're not paying, so we can make our expenses, so the people of Rhode Island uh, get what they're expecting from us, right, Th or through us. So that's, that's the premise of this. Does anybody else have a confession or a question for Representative DeBone? Okay, if not, that will conclude testimony on Representative DeBone's bill, House Bill 5598. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, members. Next, we will move to Floor Manager Edwards' bill, House Bill 5486. This was previously mentioned when Ryan Holt from the AG's office was present. It would require all applicants for employment with the Department of BHDDH or any of its licensed facilities or programs to have the Attorney General's office conduct their mandated nationwide criminal records check. Representative Edwards, welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank, you, thank you. I was a little bit late here. I was coming in from another, another uh, Zoom meeting. Fortunately, we have way too many Zoom meetings these days. Uh, th this is, Ryan Holt did a great job explaining it. Um, it basically requires organizations that have more than 250 people to get uh, records checks that go through the AG's office as opposed to other, other uh, groups. Uh, the record checks will be at a minimum every five years. The only issue I have heard on this particular piece of legislation has been the payment. There is a, uh, it, it's ambiguous in the way it was drafted that the payment shall be by the applicant or by the requesting agency. When I, wor when I have worked on uh, government facilities or on drug company facilities, I was having background checks sometimes every three to four months. Not because I'm a bad person, but because they seem to stagger um, and they can be extremely costly. Uh, I found that the, um, the companies who are requesting them uh, were more than glad to pay for them. So um, I don't see an issue here. I'm not sure how the state want, would want to handle uh, initial hires. I know the FBI uh, fingerprint check, check um, can be fairly costly because it's not digital. The FBI tends to want to want ink fingerprint checks. So uh, that is something I'm w more than willing to work with uh, the various groups on um, as far as who's going to pay and uh, how they're gonna, going to pay and at what time. That concludes my testimony, Chairman. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Edwards? No questions. We have one witness signed up. Chris Boyle from the Computer Community Provider Network. Is Mr. Boyle available? Yes, I am. Good afternoon, Mr. Boyle. This is Evan Shanley calling from the House Committee on State Government and Elections. We're discussing Floor Manager Edwards' bill, House Bill 5486. You have signed up in opposition, and you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations. Um, thank you for letting me uh, testify before the committee. I'm representing the Community Provider Network of Rhode Island. Um, CPNRI is the association of the providers of support and services to adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I have had the opportunity to speak with uh, Representative Edwards and Mr. Holt from the AG's office, as well as uh, David Belasco from Lifespan. And uh, I just want to initially say that certainly CPNRI wholly supports the, um, 
background checks for potential employees to protect what is a very vulnerable population. Um, I have uh, submitted a letter on the legislation, and uh, the concern that we would like to raise is on page two of the bill, uh, as Rep. Edwards identified the uh, language which required which requires the checks to be paid by the employee or the agency <clears throat> and in this case the uh, the providers you know such as Trudeau Arc uh, Blackstone Valley access point and and the like uh, would be required to pay for the background checks and what I would just like to point out to the committee um, that that language appears to run contrary to section six of the chapter, which that language, and I believe I've supplied it to the committee, specifically in the General Assembly did this back in 2001, uh, very specifically and unambiguously requires the department to pay for the background check. Um, and I just wanted to bring that to the attention of the committee. Uh, I do believe many of the aspects of the bill are uh, beneficial and positive, uh, but uh, I know that the ACLU has provided a letter also with concerns about the payment. And although in reality, in the practical world, the agencies for the most part that I've been able to contact are paying for the um, background checks now, many of them have raised uh, concerns about the five-year renewal uh, and other costs that they might not be able to control. At this point, they are cooperating with uh, Buddha, and uh, there is really no system for them to bill Buddha for these tests, so they have been uh, paying uh, for the most part for them. Uh, but there is a concern, I'd just like to point out to the committee, that there is this direct conflict with Section 6 of the chapter. Um, and uh, the, finally, I would just like to say I like the, the opportunity to work with um, Representative Edwards and uh, the AG's office along with Lifespan and see if uh, we can't uh, come up with a bill that's beneficial to all parties. So I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Any questions for Mr. Boyle from members of the committee? No. That will conclude testimony on House Bill 5486. Thank you again, Mr. Boyle. Next, we will move to House Bill 5596 from Chairman Craven an act relating to state affairs and government statewide public safety computer-aided dispatch records management system. It would establish a statewide public safety computer-aided dispatch records management system. Uh, Representative Craven is unavailable to testify on this bill, so we will move to the witnesses that have signed up to provide testimony. First on the list is Steve Brown from the ACLU. Is Mr. Brown available again? Good afternoon, Steve. Evan calling again. Um, we're now discussing Chairman Craven's bill, House Bill 5596, and you are signed up for verbal testimony with no position on the bill. You have the floor. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Um, we have uh, submitted uh, fairly detailed written testimony on, uh, on this legislation. We are asking for a number of amendments to it. Uh, we understand the idea behind it uh, to develop a statewide records management system for all police departments in the state to address what we understand have been sort of jurisdictional gaps in, in making sure that all the information is gathered from the myriad police departments. Um, we just want to make sure that in uh, creating this system, there are some safeguards in place uh, regarding the privacy of records, uh, ensuring that uh, inappropriate information uh, is not included in the system, uh, giving individuals an opportunity to, to be able to contest inaccurate information. These are all procedural things that we think would be very helpful. The bill itself mentions the importance of privacy and protecting civil liberties and having such a very big database. Um, uh, we just encourage the committee to take a look at the specific recommendations we have um, to ensure 
that the interests in privacy and civil liberties that the bill mentions are in fact um, codified uh, into whatever passes. Uh, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Brown? No questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Next witness, we have Chief Edward Mello, unavailable. Sid Wardell. They're not available. Okay, we'll see if we can get them later or they try us back later. Uh, that will conclude testimony on House Bill 5596. We next move to House Bill 5597, also from Chairman Craven. It's an act relating to State Affairs in Government, Uniform Unsworn Declaration Act. Gives an unsworn declaration given under the penalty of perjury the same effect as a sworn declaration and subjects to the same criminal penalties for perjury. There is one witness signed up on 5597, a Thomas Hemendinger, and I butchered that name. Is Mr., it's, let's just call him Thomas. Is Thomas available? Good afternoon, Thomas. We are here discussing House Bill 5597 from Chairman Craven, and you are signed up in support, and you have the floor, sir. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to uh, all the members of the committee. Uh, I'm testifying on behalf of the Rhode Island State Commission on Uniform State Laws. Uh, we're a statutory commission uh, created by the General Assembly uh, about 100 years ago. And uh, we take part in the National Conference of uh, Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, usually known as the Uniform Law Commission, or ULC. And every state, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands is a, uh, a member of this organization. The Uniform Unsworn Declarations Act is uh, one of several different uh, Unsworn Declarations Act that the conference has, has prepared for the state. There's one version that only applies to overseas or foreign declarations, one that applies only to domestic declarations, and then this one which applies to any declaration. Uh, the purpose is to make it easier for people to sign uh, sworn statements or affidavits in court without having to uh, use a, a notary. This is particularly important for overseas um, declarants because it's so hard to get an appointment at a U.S. embassy or U.S. consulate. Uh, but it's also important, uh, particularly since the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, because it's difficult to get in the same room and it's not always safe to be in the same room as a notary public to sign an affidavit to file in state court. So what this act does is it's modeled on a federal statute which has been very successful, uh, 28 U.S.C. 1746, and it includes a very simple form for an unsworn declaration that makes it clear to the person who's signing that they're doing so under pains and penalties of perjury. It makes the uh, a, a false statement under the statute, perjury under Rhode Island's perjury statute, and... Um, It also uh, includes some exceptions that will require the declarant to appear in front of a notary public or a consular official um, for the types of documents and situations where public policy really does dictate that an oath or affirmation take place in front of a, uh, an appropriate officer. The main exceptions are for an oath of office, which would have to be done uh, before a notary public or a, uh, an elected official. Uh, real estate transfers and mortgages, and authentication of wills under the uh, self-proven will uh, statute. Uh, for these reasons, we do urge the committee to recommend that the House pass 5597, and I'd uh, be glad to answer any questions if uh, any members of the committee have some. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Hemendinger? 
Representative Knight. Hi, Mr. Hemendiger. It's Jason Knight. How are you? Great. And you? I'm good. I'm good. Do you have any concern? I know it's a uniform law, so it's uh, particularly well vetted. But do you have any concerns um, with this as it applies to affidavits? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that there's times when I want to introduce an affidavit in court, and when they're signed with the notary, you can be assured that the affidavit came from the actual person making the affidavit. Well, this statute is specifically designed for and provides that uh, th that would be admissible in court just as a, uh, or an unsworn declaration would be admissible in court just as a, an affidavit in front of a notary public. Well, I, I know that's the point. Do you see any danger with letting unsworn declarations uh, be admissible in court on the authentication issue? Oh, I, I think I understand the... Uh, the question words, representative night is the concern that the the term is unsworn if i have an affidavit that purports to be from joe smith in court in a case with an unsworn declaration how do i know it actually came from joe smith well, the the same way you you would you would know with an affidavit because uh, you don't have the notary in court to testify as to uh, the identity of the person the um, I mean, it's called an unsworn declaration not because it's of any less dignity than swearing before a notary public, but because it's technically not sworn in front of an officer. It's merely signed under pains and penalties of perjury. It, it hasn't caused problems in the federal courts where uh, the federal statute is very similar to what we have here. And so I'm not worried about that particular issue. Okay, thanks. Representative Newberry. Yeah, just on that point, I mean, I know in my experience in civil, like in Superior Court, they're not sworn. I mean, they're sworn, but they're not notarized anyway for summary judgments and things like that. I don't know in a criminal case if it's different, but we kind of do that as it is. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good practice, but this isn't necessarily changing that. Well, I'm just thinking about those times when uh, a witness is unavailable, you want to put in an affidavit to establish a fact beyond a reasonable doubt in front of a jury. And is that a criminal procedure? I'm asking because I don't know. Yeah, in I civil mean, court, you really can't do that. Well, yeah, occasionally you can, sure. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't allow that. But <laughs> right? I mean, you can... Um, but I suppose the courts can make a rule if they want. All right. Any further questions for Mr. Hemendinger? Thank you very much. We're Thank gonna, you. We're going to go... That concludes testimony on House Bill 5597. The two witnesses who had signed up on 5596 and were unavailable before are now available. So we'll begin with Chief Edward Mello. Good afternoon, Chief. This is Evan Shanley from the House Committee on State Government and Elections. We are discussing Chairman Craven's bill, House Bill 5596, and you are signed up in support. You have the floor, sir. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How about you? Great. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to testify on this particular bill. Uh, I would like to uh, offer our support on behalf of the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association uh, for this particular bill. Uh, many of you uh, have heard this concept before. Uh, however, I know many of you, this might be a new concept. So in the history of uh, the project as it's proposed is uh, for more than four years, the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association has been pursuing uh, really a, an opportunity to combine all of our records statewide, both for our computer-aided dispatch system and our records management system. So those records wouldn't be limited to law enforcement records. It would be all-inclusive of police, fire, EMS records, how we do uh, dispatch, how we uh, handle ass asset re um, allocation, and dispatch resources throughout the state. So a little bit of history is it, the, the police agencies throughout Rhode Island for probably better than 25 years or so have contracted independently with different vendors to provide those records management and CAD solutions. Uh, those, um, those systems end up residing in silos, as does the information within those systems. Uh, the cost benefits uh, to a project that consolidates all of those records is uh, tremendous. 
Uh, the project itself, um, we've worked through this project. We've visited a number of states that have done similar projects. Um, the, the benefits in terms of the, the financial picture, uh, for example, collectively, all law enforcement agencies, just law enforcement agencies, contribute more than a million dollars uh, independently, but collectively that totals more than a million dollars for the maintenance and support of our independent software systems on an annual basis. Um, the the, the same fees would be collected through the restricted account that's mentioned in the bill, uh, with DPS being the lead agency to be able to have one vendor provide that solution for us. Um, one uh, voice in terms of, of issues that we may have with the system to get those resolved as opposed to 40 or so different voices. Um, we would be treated as a million dollar customer instead of independent small customers. Um, the the information sharing across the board um, would be basically one stop shopping for police, fire, and EMS to search records related to uh, all of those disciplines within the system. So the the we have moved along in terms of vetting companies. Um, we have, uh, in fact, 911 has already begun a relationship with a particular company that we followed uh, through the Department of Administration. Um, we are. Um, we are fully funded in terms of the capital investment for this through grant money. It would not require zero uh, capital dollars from the state on an annual basis. The users, the uh, agencies that would use it, police, fire, and EMS, would contribute similar to they do today, but it would not be to the vendor directly. It would be through the restricted account for DPS, uh, so there'd be no financial impact for the state budget for the project at all. Um, I realize there's been a couple of letters uh, of testimony provided, in particular the uh, ACLU's uh, concerns, and I'll offer this as um, just information. So the, the model that you have proposed for you in terms of the board of directors that would advise the director of DPS and that board would be advised furthermore by a working group is the same model that the FBI has been following for better than 20 years with their criminal justice information system. So as you might imagine, there's a lot of criminal records that are housed and maintained by the FBI across the country and sometimes internationally. Uh, the model that is proposed uh, in this bill is the same model that the FBI follows where there's an advisory policy board that gives guidance and direction to the director of the FBI in terms of setting policy. So the concerns that are outlined within the ACLU letter, um, really uh, this this bill and the proposal that there's one policy really addresses those concerns because everybody would follow the same policy as opposed to every agency that might have records acting independently and dealing with those records of concern in independent fashions. So um, I can answer any questions that, uh, that you may have this evening, but that is the summary of the proposed project as we're moving forward. Uh, it does have the support of the, the superintendent of the state police. Uh, it does have the support of the attorney general. Uh, and it certainly has the support of both the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association and the Rhode Island Fire Chiefs Association. Any questions for Chief Mello? Thank you, Chief. Next we have Sid Wardell. Is Mr. Wardell available? Good afternoon, Mr. Wardell. Evan Shanley from the State Committee on Municipal Government and Housing. That's tomorrow. State government and elections. We're talking about Chairman Craven's bill, House Bill 5596, and you have signed up in support. We just heard from Chief Mello as to all the reasons why we should be supporting this. Um, so you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, the great thing, having worked with uh, Chief Mello for many years, is, uh, and especially on this project, is I think he hit probably uh, all the points that I wanted to hit, uh, with the exception of a couple which I think are relevant. <clears throat> one of them is uh, one of the bit of biggest criticisms that we have, I think, of our services that are being provided uh, is the ability for the public and the review of data uh, that comes of that. I know our biggest partner um, is the Department of Transportation and Highway Safety. And one of the things that they have to do is, you know, when they're looking at crash data, 
uh, they have to do a poll or an inquiry of every single agency in Rhode Island, and that's you know both police, fire, um, and EMS. And what this would do, this system, one portion of it, what it will be able to do is allow certain stakeholders of ours to actually have the data uh, and not just be, you know, relatively new, but actually live. And that's something that we can't do now. Um, there can be a fatal accident that happens somewhere in Rhode Island, and unless you make phone calls about it, uh, you're not going to know uh, that maybe that it even happened. So one of the biggest things that we're looking forward to is the forward-facing end of this, which allows the public and the stakeholders to be able to get, you know, some of that data that's live. Uh, I know Chief Mello uh, hit on the idea of the process that we went through to come to this product. I want to assure you we're not proposing some new product that's going to be built and then we have concerns of whether or not it's going to uh, you know, work appropriately here in Rhode Island. What we're doing is we're taking a product that is proven, has been proven throughout the country, uh, some large counties bigger than Rhode Island, uh, and we're actually taking that product, and although it may have some things that are specific to Rhode Island, it is a product that is, you know, proven. So um, on that, unless there's any questions, uh, uh, if there are any questions, I certainly would answer them, sir. Any questions for Mr. Wardell? Chairman, I have a question, if I may. Representative Tanzi. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wardell, it, you and I have both been a part of the crisis intervention training um, process for police throughout the state. And I'm wondering, I, I've often heard from the officers during these trainings that there are difficulties in discussing things um, as a, a, a person moves from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So when a person is in a, having a mental health crisis and you know they may not be in their hometown where the, the chief happens to know them, the officers on duty happen to know how best to deal with them. This would give a little bit of that insight. Um, would this software be a part of that, where they could get the tips on how to deal with the individuals if they're experiencing a mental break? Right. So, you you know, you hit right on the head that one of the biggest issues that we face, and whatever the crisis is, but specific to your example, one of the biggest issues that we face is if we don't know uh, or have contact with that individual because they're from that hometown, uh, you don't necessarily have any background for that information. So uh, one of the things, again, and, and this is going to bring in the policy side of it that Chief Mello spoke to, you know, all the, all the um, uh, HIPAA rules, all of those things are still in place. And we're really not collecting more data than we ever were except we're now taking it out of that, you know, so-called file cabinet that might be in one police department and making that available and making that so that crucial decisions or help or whatever it might be. And, and to also add that the resources that are available in the state at that time would now be known at dispatch. So, you know, for instance, if you had a person who was in crisis, and they spoke a language that's, uh, you know, not a common language to that agency, we would very quickly be able to actually pull the database of dispatch and find out if there's a person on duty that speaks a certain language or, you know, uh, or we needed a female because there was a female involved and the department didn't have a female that was there. So, yeah, there, there's, I mean, the, the limit, there is really no limitations on what this is going to do for us and that's why we, when we first originally were looking at this, it really was at the records management end uh, and dispatch for police. But when we, when we did our uh, bidding and the process and walked it through, you know, we quickly realized that the fire side had to be equivalent and everything we did on the police side, we, made, we need to make sure it was on the fire side, which I think speaks to the, you know, the, the more of the EMS side of the house, what you're referring to. Right. And as we did with the uniform code um, for the school system, I think that similarly, this would provide a, um, a universal way for people to do reporting. That way, um, everyone would be filling out the forms in the same way, or at least guided to have that opportunity um, happen so that we really can begin to compare how um, one department um, 
is faring uh, to others and um, you know we can find ways to collect data similarly so that we can when we share the data it's most useful thank you yes any, absolutely any further questions for mr. Wardell all right that will once again conclude testimony on house bill 5596 next we'll move to representative Casimiro's bill house bill 5757 an act relating to elections campaign finance reporting it would increase the fines for late filing of campaign finance reports to $100 for a second offense $500 for a third offense and $1,000 for all subsequent offenses representative Casimiro welcome thank you chairman thank you members of the committee um, it, this bill 5757 goes a little bit further than late fees it also goes to um, speaks to knowingly violating campaign finance laws and that's really the, the, the crux of this matter we had a, a local situation where we had a candidate who just completely disregarded um, campaign finance laws and just kept writing small checks we're not going to change behavior if small checks are the only thing that is going to be a deterrent so by increasing these fines, I, I'm hoping that people will pay better attention and take our campaign finance laws a little bit more seriously. Um, this person made a mockery of our campaign finance laws in the last two elections, and I think that this is a bill that will get us to a point where we can address some of those issues and really, really hold people accountable. I mean, I think these, some of these fees were established decades ago, and it's really just about holding people accountable during their campaigns and making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and not taking everything for granted when it comes to campaign finance fines. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Casimiro? Representative Nardone? Yes. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Representative uh, Casimiro, um, is this the, the only person that you know of that is uh, been non-compliant with this with the no there have been others is, is there several there have others, been others. Is it, can you can you identify several others it's so blatant the last two elections i was asked by my i'm sorry I'm, i didn't say anything i'm just waiting is there is it one or is there 10 is there a hundred or i don't know I, i've gotten this complaint for the last two um election cycles from um from people in north kingstown and exeter um i don't i didn't count them but I think it's just, I, I think it's good practice for us to increase these fines because they are kind of outdated and if we expect people to do the right thing, we need to um, give them something to be concerned about. Any follow-up, Representative Nardo? Uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Representative Newberry. I just want to make an observation. I've never um, personally been in a situation where a race that I was involved in, I had any of my opponents do anything, but I've, I've followed enough campaigns around the state over the last 20 years uh, to know there are people out there that do flout these laws. I, I, I don't know about the particular situation Rep. Casimiro's mentioned where the person just pays a $25 fine. I think that most situations seems to be people who just ignore them altogether and they rack up these accumulated late fines. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go into detail here in spare time. I can think of many examples. Uh, I, I, I don't have any problem with increasing the fines a little bit. I think $1,000 might be a little too much. And I'm not sure I think it should be a felony, but um, I think we need to give the Board of Elections some more tools to actually enforce the laws they have in the books. Because it is a little ridiculous to have people, I remember one candidate who ran for state senate uh, and just ignore, I mean, I know what was going on. They were getting all kinds of what we would call dark money dumped into their campaign they lost. Um, I don't know what they would have done if they'd won, but uh, it was ridiculous. They just didn't file a report, ever. Um, so we need to do something. I don't know if this bill is the best way to do it. We got to do something, though. Um, Representative Newberry, I'd be happy to work with you on any language that you want to see changed. And just to be clear, this was never an opponent of mine. I don't want anybody to think that this is I'm being vindictive. It was never an opponent of mine, but it was someone in the local election down here that just completely disregarded campaign finance laws. It would be helpful if the Board of Elections would actually come in and tell us what they would like. I know they've talked about it and they've complained about not having any tools, but I don't, they're not here today, are they? I mean, I don't know how much notice they got of this, but no one has signed up. It would be helpful if they told us what they thought would be helpful. Maybe, maybe that would be a good um, a topic for uh, Representative Knight's subcommittee for um, processes and um, for oversight. Representative Knight. 
Uh, <coughs> hi, hi, Rep. Casimiro. Um, I think, I mean, I, I know where you're coming from with this bill, and, and I agree with uh, uh, Rep. Newberry that uh, I'm not sure it's felony worthy. Um, I don't want, you know, the problem with our campaign finance stuff is that it's a little complicated and uh, it's it's already a little bit of a discouragement, I think, for people to run for office. Uh, if they take a few minutes and, and get familiar with it, uh, I know that they can comply and the board will work with those good faith people. I don't want to I don't want to jam them up because even where we are these days with the fines um, for the for the people who really are uh, what's intentional about non-compliance and I have I you know I've, I've experienced it with uh, a couple of candidates in my area um, you know the the fines could be just a whole lot bigger than they are now nothing's going to happen unless the board of elections takes the steps to enforce the law and that's something that they have not done uh and i've talked to them about it um on an on the record and off the record like you know what's your rules for enforcement so i think um the intent of the bill is clear but i think our problem frankly is uh in the board of, of elections willingness to pursue someone uh, for these fines and, and to make an example out of someone. So I, um, Representative Van, I, I agree with you and I'd be happy to work with you and anybody else who wants to work on changing some of the language in this. But I think I mean, my intent is not to discourage anybody from running for office. And my intent is not to really penalize those who are making an honest mistake. It's to make sure people who are knowingly and willingly making these, um, uh, so what I'm looking for, these uh, infractions to make it, make them understand how serious this is and that it won't be tolerated in Rhode Island elections. Any further questions for Representative Casimiro? Mr. Chairman. I think I hear Representative Hull from above. Yes, uh, please mark me present. Uh, Representative Casimiro and Representative Knight. Um, we're not in the... I shouldn't say that. Uh, I understand the intent of the bill, mm -hmm. and I understand where we're going or where you want to go with the bill. I just don't want to discourage people to run for office in the minutia that the Board of Elections should be doing for us than a bill that we should have in front of the bill that we have in front of us. It should be in the office of the elected board of elections, not us. Should we then ask them, which we should ask them, what do you need from us to stiffen up the laws so that it's fine for all of us, so that we're not put on a uh, we're not put on a pedestal that. We're doing it for you or me or whatever. If you don't, if you understand what I'm saying, uh, Representative Hall, I do, and I, I I hear what you're saying, and I'm not trying to make anybody. I'm not trying to discourage anybody from running for office, but those perpetual offenders need to be addressed. And I don't know what what more. I mean, I we down here we talk to the board of elections almost on a, a weekly basis, and, and nothing is was getting done. So I'm happy to I'm I'm happy to work with anyone who wants to talk about how we can stop this stuff from happening. And and. Maybe we might need a different bill to address the Board of Elections. Are we open to that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Holt, do you want your votes recorded to hold all bills on the calendar for further study? Absolutely. Okay. Um, there are no other witnesses signed up on Representative Casimiro's bill. Does anybody else have a question for Representative Casimiro? No, nope, that will conclude testimony on House Bill 5757. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next, we will move to <laughs> Representative Agello's bills. I think we have her available on WebEx. First bill is House Bill 5599, an act relating to businesses and professions. Public accountancy eliminates the words moral turpitude as a cause of refusal to issue a license to various professionals. Representative Agell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Steve Brown asked if we might put this one off. 
he's um, participating in another committee hearing right now and said that he would email me or text me when um, when he's available again. So could we put the moral turpitude bill uh, aside for Evan. some time and go to 5600? Um, apparently we have Steve Brown here right now. Or, no, he's not available. Okay. Yeah, then we'll come back to both of your bills, Representative Agello. Okay. Uh, and instead, we will do Representative Place's bill, House Bill 5430, an act relating to state affairs and government administrative procedures, administrative hearings to follow superior court rules of procedure and evidence, provides for subpoena of witnesses and evidence. Representative Place, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. Um, it's not necessarily that complicated. It sounds a lot more complicated than that. What this is an attempt to... Uh, provide relief from what's known as Chevron deference. Uh, seen some before, you know, a bunch of lawyers generally, I'll just, I'll stick with what it is, but Chevron deference generally is the idea that um, a regulatory agency gets to, the courts have said that a regulatory agency gets to define a law as they see fit. So the deference is given to that agency in the interpretation, in the interpretation of the law. And generally speaking, that, that, that really restrains any, any person on the outside, whether it be an individual or a company or anything along those lines from being able to say, hey, look, this, regulate, this regulatory agency has gone way too far. There's no way that when this law was passed, this is with the intent of what the, uh, the legislative body meant. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting upstairs to testify before HEW because um, of a similar, you know, similar reason. Um, I've got a bill, call it the pickle bill. And right now on the law, Rhode Island allows home farm stands to sell, to sell jams, jellies, preserves, and acid foods such as vinegars that are prepared using fruits, vegetables, and or herbs that have been grown locally. My interpretation of that means pickles. Just pickles. But Department of Health has decided that um, that doesn't mean pickles. So I have to go upstairs and before the health committee, health committee and asked for a slight change to the law to add pickles and relish to that legislation. And if a you know farm stand owner gets fined by the Department of Health because they've been selling pickles for the last 20 years at their farm's farm stand thinking that they were legal because of how they read this, they go before an administrative hearing, they're gonna give my understanding, almost full deference to the regulating, regulatory agency. This gives the ability of the person on the outside and hopefully acts as a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it would prevent the regulating, regulatory agencies to go, from going so far, knowing that you know, folks can now do this. So again, it, it's an attempt to, to pretty much overturn Chevron deference in our administrative hearings in our courts uh, giving the uh, the ability of the everyday person, the company, in, in, in businesses in the state, the ability to argue that the regulators just gone too far. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Place? No questions. Thank you very much, Rep. Good luck. Thank you. We're now going to go back to Representative Agello's bills. Um, told that Mr. Brown's available, Representative Agello. So we'll go back to five five nine nine. And uh, would you like to introduce that bill? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Five five nine nine is the legislation that I've put in a couple of times before. It would remove the language around um, crime of moral turpitude on, from licensing law for a pretty long list of um, workers in Rhode Island. It includes public accountants, private security businesses, engineers, land surveyors, veterinary practices, podiatrists, chiropractors, dentists and dental hygienists, um, MDs, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, audiologists, uh, hearing aid fitters and dealers, landscape architects, 
physicians' assistants, athletic trainers, chemical dependency professionals, medical waste licensees, explosives manufacturers, um, off-track betting, battery sales agents. Uh, it's and then at the very end in section 27 um, deals with firefighters and police who um, may have been accused of moral turpitude and um, could have their um, their ability to um, practice as police or firefighters removed according to this law. It's antiquated. There's no place in Rhode Island law where moral turpitude is defined. I looked up moral in our index of laws and didn't see anything. And between Turnpike and um, Turtle, logically, um, turpitude would appear in the index, but it doesn't. The turn, turnpike just goes on to turtle in our index of laws. Um, so there's no um, definition. There are plenty of other, in these various statutes, reasons that a, um, a license could be denied, including con um, committing a crime. And uh, I think as we move towards making it easier pe for people to get uh, licenses um, away from the practice of, of never forgiving someone for um, perhaps a crime in their youth, um, this, this language should go. Thank you. Happy Any to answer questions and um, Steve Brown can take over from here. Any questions for Representative Agello? Okay, we'll go to Mr. Steve. Mr. Chairman? Oh, yes, we have a question Rep. from Representative Felix. Go ahead, Representative. Um, thank you, Rep. Agello, for submitting this bill. And it's not most a question, but a comment. And um, I know this is mostly state law, but just wanted to point out in immigration law, this term had been already dealt to be very nebulous and difficult to even adhere to or define. Um, although not unconstitutional or um, vague uh, to their terms, yet it's still nebulous to define, which makes it, a, it very, very hard for practitioners to figure out what is a crime of moral turpitude. So I'm in agreement with this bill, and I just wanted to voice uh, my support for it. So thank you for submitting this. Thank you. Any further questions for Representative Agello or comments? Okay, we can go to Mr. Brown again. Is he available? Steve, welcome back. We are discussing House Bill 5599 from Representative Bajello. You have the floor. Uh, thank you again. Uh, the ACLU uh, strongly supports this legislation. It's a bill that's been introduced for a few years now, but I think this is especially a year for, for the committee to look favorably on it. Uh, you've heard from uh, Representative Bajello just how, uh, how much this, uh, this term, moral turpitude, appears in a wide variety of licensing statutes. Um, I want to emphasize that it's been, as, as far as I can tell, it's been over a decade since the General Assembly has passed any licensing law that contains this very vague language. Uh, as Representative Felix noted, it is, a you know, there are lots of lawyers on, on this committee, and I would defy any of them to define the term and come to agreement on what, uh, what crimes fall into the definition of moral turpitude. Um, the reason that we think it's especially important to pass it now is that last year um, the legislature passed another very important law, the Fair Chance Licensing uh, Statute, um, which imposes restrictions on all state licensing agencies to uh, limit um, what criminal records um, constitute um, disqualifying information for purposes of getting a license. Um, it's a very important law. We're very concerned that for those licensing statutes that still have this very archaic requirement about allowing people to be disqualified
from getting a license because they've been convicted of a crime of moral turpitude really undermines that statute. It would, it would be an end run and allow some licensing agencies to deny a license to a person because they say they've been convicted of a crime of moral turpitude, even though it would not constitute a disqualifying crime under the fair chance licensing law. So we think it's just a matter of complementing the work that the legislature did last year to pass this bill, get rid of this archaic language, and make sure that every licensing agency in the state is following uh, the fair chance licensing statute and not inappropriately and arbitrarily disqualifying people from jobs uh, and licenses that they are perfectly qualified for simply because of some past criminal conduct that doesn't meet the standards that um, the fair chance licensing law requires. Um, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Brown? I, I, I do. Representative Newberry. Yeah, just a quick question for either Mr. Brown or for Representative Jello. I mean, this bill makes perfect sense to me. Is there any particular reason or obstacle that we know of why it hasn't passed in the past? Not that I'm aware of, no. It may just be inertia, um, as you know, sometimes happens. Uh, but I'm not aware of any, uh, any direct opposition to it. Any further questions for Steve? Okay, that concludes testimony on House Bill 5599. We next move to House Bill 5600, also from Representative Agello, an act relating to elections, conduct of election and voting equipment and supplies. This includes the General Assembly election within the category of elections subject to the risk limiting audits within the jurisdiction of the Board of Elections. Representative Agello, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman um, Shanley. Uh, this legislation is a follow-up to um, the initial um, passage of this law allowing the um, Board of Elections to do risk-limiting audits. And when we um, passed that law several years ago, we inadvertently wrote ourselves out of it. On page 11, you will see the, the, the word statewide primary. Um, statewide is crossed out. So we would have primaries, general and special elections in accordance with the requirements of this section, actually local, et cetera, et cetera, but not say statewide. And that, so that brings us into, and then on page, on um, line 16, um, crossing out statewide and replacing it with state um, to make it clear, again, that we intend our own races to be um, subject to audit if the Board of Elections so decides. We were really kind of leaders in the country. I think Colorado maybe was the only other state that was was enacting legislation around risk limiting audits. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, there were two elections, one in Foster and one, I believe, in North Kingstown, where the um, tabulating machines were not correct. He, um, synced with the ballots and um, they were able to look at the results of those two elections and see you know we, we've really got to look at this and they discovered what the problem was that that the um, ballot and the calculating machines were not in sync um, so it's it's pretty simple um, but it certainly makes sense if we're going to allow risk limiting, limiting audits for local races and statewide races um, and special elections. We ought to be in the mix, too. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Agello? There is one witness signed up in support, and that's John Marion from Common Cause. Is Mr. Marion available? 
Good afternoon, Mr. Marion. This is Evan Shanley from the House Committee on State Government and Elections. We're discussing House Bill 5600 from Representative Agello, and you are signed up in support. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to Representative Agello for introducing this bill. Um, my name is John Marion from Common Cause, Rhode Island. I'll be very brief. Um, we uh, authored a bill in 2013 uh, that we asked a Representative Jello to uh, submit, uh, and we were lucky enough that that bill passed in 2017. But when I wrote the original bill, I made a mistake. Um, I wrote uh, statewide instead of state, uh, and that means that uh, the State Board of Elections can only audit uh, statewide elections or local elections or federal elections, but they cannot uh, audit elections for the General Assembly. Uh, so I put a donut hole uh, in the bill, and the General Assembly sits uh, in that donut hole. So this bill would simply fix that mistake, my mistake. Um, and uh, as the Board of Elections implements these risk-limiting audits, uh, they're going to get more efficient at them uh, and be able to audit more and more contests on the ballot uh, and we want them to eventually be able to audit uh, many contests on the ballot, including General Assembly elections, uh, and this would let them do that. These audits were implemented um, in 2020, so both the June presidential primary and the presidential election uh, were successfully audited, making uh, Rhode Island only the second state in the nation to do this. And it's really it's called the gold standard of election security. This is uh, the best way, uh, most efficient way to audit an election. So we think um, that we should keep improving it. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions for Mr. Marion? No questions. Thank you for calling in, Mr. Marion. Thank you. That will conclude testimony on House Bill 5600. Next, we'll move to House Bill or House Resolution 5635 from Representative Kislak. Uh, the resolution to approve and publish and to submit to the electors a proposition of amendment to the Constitution and it would change the voting age from 18 years to 6 years. Representative Kislak, you have the floor. Welcome. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Shanley. And I am uh, grateful to the committee for the time this evening to hear uh, my proposed resolution that would lower the voting age from 18 to 16. The first time I heard that our young people are ad advocating to vote at 16 um, was when I started running. And we all end up with lots of, um, lots of questionnaires for uh, to seek endorsements and two of those questionnaires that I received one from the Young Democrats and one for the Coalition Against Gun Violence both asked in different ways if I would support efforts to lower the voting age. My very first and gut reaction was we vote at 18. I was sure that that was the way things were because it is how they are. And it never occurred to me before that moment that we should consider changing that. But when I thought about it for a little while, because if two groups are asking me about this and coming to talk to me about how important it is to enfranchise younger people than we had before, then I realized I should listen carefully. One of the things I seek to do in the world is to build uh, the world and our country and our state for the future. And that's one of the ways I see my job as a legislator. And our young people are getting more involved and there are lots and lots of good reasons to lower the voting age to 16. Some of them have submitted written testimony. There's a national campaign for Vote 16 and there is a letter from Generation Citizen in the written testimony. So I am really looking forward to diving into this conversation here in Rhode Island about why our youth should have more of a say. And I thank you and the committee for your time in this important conversation. I'm really pleased to be presenting this 
uh, legislation, this resolution for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Kislak? Another question. Representative Shellcross Smith. Yes, my question is how many other states have done this thus far? I believe that's in the written testimony. I don't, we would be the first state to do this statewide. Other municipalities are doing this in municipal and school board elections. So this would be local, state, and federal, or just? Yes, yes, so for a lot of reasons, the working group that came together two years ago discussed what we wanted to do, and there are many of us who would be okay with starting with municipal or some subset of elections, but for both the ease of administering elections and for uh, the... Um, the elegance of this bill, which simply changes the number 18 to 16 for our consideration tonight, uh, this is what we introduced. And ultimately, I do think that lowering the voting age for everyone for all elections to 16 is something we should strongly consider. I also note that Representative Kassar, and it's next on the list, has a bill for consideration that would allow uh, folks who are going to turn 18 before the general election to vote also in primary. So I absolutely think that there are a lot of incremental steps that we can and should consider. And also, I'm really happy to be presenting the just lower it to 16 option. Great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Representative Kislak? Well, Mr. Chairman. Representative Holt. Uh, Representative, uh, the problem I have is the slope that we could get ourselves into. And, okay, 16. Why can't we drink at 16? And that's a legitimate argument because if I can vote for you or myself to put you into an office to represent me, well, why can't I do other things uh, if you know what I mean? And I, I, I need to hear that. Yes, uh, thank Okay, Representative. Yeah, thank you, Representative Paul. And I think that adolescence and young adulthood is all a time of transition. And the, the numbers that are the boundaries for when we get to do different things in our adulthood are um, just numbers, which is why my very first instinct was we vote at 18 because that's how it is. It's the age we get to do it. We drive at 16. We drink at 18. They're, they're different. Um, I guess we drink at 21. They're different ages um, when we get to do different things. And I think that there are really good reasons to consider lowering the voting age, which don't just have to do with that our young people are ready and they want to. It also has to do with raising and supporting young citizens in participating actively in our democracy. There are really great arguments to be made that if young people vote while they're still in high school, and they register to vote while they still live at their parents' house and they go with their peers from high school to go vote, then they are more likely to form lasting voting habits. And I think that that's a really positive reason to consider this. I also, I have two children who are 11 and 15 and we talk about this sometimes. And I, um, my 15-year-old is clear that he gets to vote for the, in the next presidential election, no matter what we do. The 11-year-old is very clear that 11 is too young to be voting. Um, but I think this is a great conversation for us all to be having and considering about what the best practices are and what we can do here in Rhode Island to support a vibrant democracy. Oh, well, I, I, I love the idea, <laughs> and, and if I could agree with you somewhat, I have two children, and I will tell you, at the age of 16, they're not quite there. <laughs> 
And they are quite there, if you know what I mean. And it shouldn't be worried about what we've been tasked to do, if you know what I mean, as, as representatives, as uh, adults, let's put it that way, as adults. And I'll, I'll leave it at as adults, because if you're under the age and you get in trouble as a juvenile, it's me to step in, say no, that's in juvenile. Not that they're not capable of understanding what's going on or understand the consequences. They have that unique perspective or that unique, uh, how should I put it, uh, that unique uh, pocket is where they're at. My argument is I don't need to push them any forward than where they're at now, if you understand what I'm saying. I understand that they are capable of doing, but there is sometimes we have to say, you're here, and until you get here, A to B, we'll move to that. I'm probably not explaining it well enough, but I think you understand where I'm coming from. Because I, I, I advocate for juveniles that they shouldn't be, uh, and I have to uh, tell people that I'm a police officer by trade, and sometimes they will move juveniles from the juvenile part to adults, and they're not yep. adults. I absolutely agree with you about that. I also um, am really glad that we're having this conversation because I think we should have this conversation and see where we land as a legislature. I think there are, I know that there are five or six letters already submitted in written testimony and I think there may be one or two folks waiting to testify uh, by phone right now. Okay. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Not a problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Representative Nardone. Yes, uh, Rep. Kislak. Um, just a quick question. Um, where did you come up with the number 16 the, as, as the age? Was it just arbitrary, or is there some kind of data that led you to believe that? You know, why didn't you start 13, 14? Why, why 16? Right. Well, there's, um, it's, it's a part of a national campaign for Vote 16. And one of the places that the conversation started uh, was uh, from the survivors of the Parkland school shooting were very frustrated that folks were making decisions for them and that were affecting their lives. And this, uh, as a national movement, came in part from there, that they wanted to be able to have more of a say. Representative Nardone, do you have a follow-up? No, we'll leave it at that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any further questions for Representative Kislak? I have a uh, quick comment, if I may. Sure, Mr. Representative Chairman. Felix. Um, I just want to note that this may be a novel idea here in the United States, but across the country it's not. Uh, so we have about 22 countries uh, that actually allow the voting age to be 16, and then we have uh, about 20 other countries or so that do 17. Um, so again, it's not a novel idea, but in my country, in Dominican Republic, if you're 16 and you're married, you are able to, uh, to uh, vote. Of course, being 16 and married is another issue, so we won't talk about that. Um, and then in, in terms of Representative uh, Hall's point, in terms of being 18 or 16 and whether you drink or not, I just want to point out also that we allow our youth to join the military at a very young age and also at even 18 and they're not allowed to drink and we're not changing that law so i just want to be cognizant of the fact that uh we do have laws and in, in, in 
in place that limit our, our youth's ability or, or allow our youth to be involved in different activities without that implication in terms of drinking. Although I do want to recognize that it could be a discussion for later. But again, in these 22 countries and most of them, the drinking age is 18 um, and yet their voting age is 16. Uh, so I just want to express my support for this bill just in recognition that it's not a noble idea. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, Chairman Hull, um, I just want to make a quick point. It's 5.33. We only technically have this room until 6 o'clock, and we have five other bills and uh, close to 20 additional witnesses that have signed up to testify on those bills. So I would ask that we defer whatever comments we can to, to written testimony um, or following up with the bill sponsor in person or via email at some point in the future. Very well, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two witnesses signed up, uh, Noah Glickman and Samia Nash. We can start with Mr. Glickman, and uh, due to time constraints, we're going to try and limit testimony to three minutes. Samia. It's Samia? Samia's available. Is Mr. Glickman not testifying? He's next. He's next, okay. Um, Samia, is she available now on the line? Good afternoon, Samia. This is Evan Shanley from the House Committee on State Government and Elections. We're discussing Representative Kislak's bill to change the voting age from 18 to 16. Um, we are limited in terms of the amount of time that we have, um, but we would like to hear from you and if, if you could speak from the heart as to why you are supporting this legislation, that would be great. Of course. Hi, my name is Samia Nash, and I am calling in support of the House Bill 5635 um, to change the voting age lower to age 16. And I'm in support because even though I am 18 currently, I did want to be able to have a say in local and national um, elections. Um, I done my research with my family at a young age and making sure that I understand the po policies that a lot of elected um, campaigns, or not campaigns, but candidates um, are running for. And I just wanted to be able to have my voice heard um, as a young black girl and also as um, somebody who resides in the United States um, to just have, you know, my voice ahead and also be able to vote for somebody who I feel is adequate and enough to be um, our elected official. Um, I know that a lot of students of my age um, aren't very, um, they aren't taught about civics education and understanding um, how to vote for somebody, how to register to vote, um, what to do when you're looking up the policies for like uh, for the candidates that are running, um, and I think that you know having that within our schools and also allowing that to um, educate our students will allow students to vote at a younger age. A lot of students at the age of 16 are very smart and very very in tune with what is going on in the news and on social media, and they feel like their voices aren't heard enough. So I feel that if Students and children are able to vote at a younger age. Um, at the age of 16, the least would be um, great so that we have more younger voices being heard in the government and also in our lives. Thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Nash? Samia, thank you very much for taking the time to call in today. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Noah Glickman. Is Mr. Glickman available? Good afternoon, Mr. Glickman. This is Evan Shanley calling from the House Committee on State Government and Elections. We're discussing Representative Kislak's bill to reduce the voting age from 18 to 16, and you've signed up in support of this bill. Um, mm -hmm. You have the floor to tell us why. I would just ask that you keep your comments as brief as possible because we have another committee that is supposed to be coming into this room shortly and a bunch of other bills to, to get through. So anything you can do to consolidate your testimony and speak from the heart would be much appreciated. Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for having me. Um, and I'll, of course, speak briefly. Um, and I'll just say that from a pretty young age, I have felt disenfranchised. Um, 
until, you know, I turned 18 and I earned the right to vote. Um, but I would say that at least by the age of 16, I had a better understanding of the workings of our government um, than I would say most adults have in the United States today. Um, and that's not to brag or to, it's probably more credit to my education than anything, um, but it's more to say that the right to vote doesn't come with any sort of educational standards, not, not recently at least, um, and that we have an obligation to support every, every human being in this country you know, innate, innate desire and innate ability to participate in our democracy. Um, I've interacted with a lot of the activist members of the high school, uh, high school political community in Rhode Island, and I have to say that they too have a, probably a much better grasp of the political workings of this country than most adults I interact with on a regular basis. Um, and to ignore that fact is to ignore the most fundamental piece of our democracy. Um, that everyone has a right to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling in, Mr. Glickman. Are there any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Glickman? Thank you so much. Uh, well, that will conclude testimony on House Resolution uh, 5. Mr. Chairman, yes. if I may. Chairman Hall, of course, go ahead. If I may, and I have to say this, the only thing I'm worried about of the bill is the bill to work against the youth. That's what I'm worried about, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative, because I understand where we need to be and that your youth are very bright, very smart. I do not want the same bill to work against young youth, children, because they're not of the age of 18. But, oh, they are, they can vote. That's what I'm worried about uh, uh, with this bill. I'm not against the bill. I just know society and lawyers, <laughs> don't get me wrong, and not to be, no, not to be disrespectful, and how they can turn this bill around because we have good intentions, and, and, and anybody who called in, yes, yes. I'm realistic, I understand it, I work in the world, and I work in how they could change this around to work against my children in my community. That's all, and I need to say that we can move on. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments on House Resolution 5635? Thank you. That will allow us to move on to Representative Kassar's bill, House Bill 5640. Uh, this would allow individuals who have not reached the age of 18 years to vote in a primary election as long as the voter will be 18 as of the date of the general or special election. Is Representative Kassar available? Good afternoon, Representative Kassar. How are you? Hello, Chairman. I'm doing fine, thanks. Thanks We're for having me in the committee hearing. Absolutely. Uh, I just introduced your bill, 5640, and you have the floor to discuss it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, um, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Um, regarding Bill 5640, um, I would request that we uh, reschedule this piece of legislation for a hearing at a later date. Um, the bill is supported by students and educators um, in both communities that I uh, represent, and um, due to the short time between the posting of the agenda and the hearing, it was difficult for folks to get um, their testimony organized. So. Um, a, a bit of a delay um, even until the next uh, agenda would be great in order to assist the public in engaging um, if the committee would consider uh, rescheduling. 
Okay, that seems reasonable. We'll talk to uh, legal counsel and see if we can put this on uh, another calendar for another day. All right, much appreciated. I appreciate the time. Sure thing. All right. Thanks so much. There are Bye -bye. no witnesses signed up on House Bill 5640, so that will conclude testimony on that bill. Next, we will move to Leader Filippi's bill, House Bill 5422, an act relating to elections, Rhode Island campaign contributions and expenditures reporting it would require nonprofit entities and candidates to comply with reporting requirements for transportation and other amenities provided to any candidate and prohibits nonprofit owned by a candidate to provide any other candidate such amenities. Is uh, Leader Filippi available? He's not available. Okay, we will come back to him. I know he was he was working, so um, we can take up uh, Chairwoman Williams' bills if she is available, and if not, we can go to First Vice Chair Messier's bill. Okay, let's uh, let's go to First Vice Chair Messier's bill. It's her legislation, so I will uh, I will have her run the hearing. Okay, um, House. House Resolution 5421 uh, is a resolution to approve and submit to the electors a proposition of amendment to the Constitution of the state, uh, and it's entitled Right to an Adequate Education. Adds two sections to the Constitution, guarantees residents adequate education, and makes rights guaranteed under the Constitution judicially enforceable. I have a little bit more information I'd like to share with you about this resolution. The John Hopkins report found that the Providence Public School District has among the lowest academic results of any urban school district in the United States. Coupled with our dismal Rye cast results. It is abundantly clear that system accountability is almost non existent in Rhode Island public, public education. In 2019, the General Assembly enacted many needed reforms, including site based management, the creation of statewide curriculum, and ride support for failing schools. These reforms mirror the Massachusetts Education Reform Act and are a step in the right direction. But to bring true accountability and reform to education in Rhode Island, we need to make a change to the constitutional right. It is somewhat ironic that inmates at the ACI can go to court for the enforcement of their rights, but students are not entitled to do this to the same protections. If we want students to achieve at the same level as their peers in the Commonwealth, then we need to amend the state constitution and guarantee students the right to an equitable adequate and meaningful education. The Hopkins report is one of many that have been published on Rhode Island schools. From the Tebow Com Commission in 1965 to last year's Senate task force findings, there have been dozens of reports on Rhode Island education and they detail low achievement, infrastructure deficiencies, inadequate funding, the high cost of transportation, and the unique challenges facing urban schools. They all have one thing in common. They expose the shortcomings within our system of education, but almost all have failed to prompt the sustained reforms needed to positively change student outcomes. Allowing students to receive the education they are entitled to will require us to amend the Rhode Island Constitution. In 1994, our Supreme Court held the education clause confers no such right nor does it guarantee an equal, adequate, and meaningful education. In contrast, in 1993, the Commonwealth Supreme Court found that the state had a duty to ensure the education of its children in the public schools. Within two months, Governor Weld pledged an additional $2 billion in, educating, in education funding, and the legislature enacted the Education Reform Act. Empowering students with the right to seek relief from the courts will force the system to follow through on promised reforms that date back to the 1960s. Therefore, I urge you to approve 2021 House Bill 
5421 and place the question the right to an adequate education on the ballot for 2022. Thank you, and I know we have some um, other witnesses to testify. Um, thank you, Representative Messier, and I'd be happy to assist you as we conduct this hearing. Okay. Uh, the first witness is Secretary of State Gorbea, if she's available. Can I say something? Oh. Just hold, hold on a moment there, yes, no Secretary worries, no Gorbea. Worries. I see this we have a question from the panel. Yeah, no, I, I, look, I understand we have a lot of witnesses, and I know that um, there's another hearing coming up, and you know we don't want to rush this, but I want to make an observation. There's no question that public education in this state, particularly in certain districts, is a disgrace. Uh, a lot of what Representative Messier said I agree with completely, particularly in the city of Providence from everything I've heard. Um, however, being a constitutional amendment, this is understandably vague. Whatever it means for an adequate and meaningful education, uh, that's, that's a monumentally legislative determination. We elect, we do not elect our judges in this state. Federal judges are appointed, state judges are appointed, and those are lifetime appointments. And this specifically allows for judicial enforcement, including injunctive relief. I just want to make the observation that if this amendment were to pass, we would effectively be transferring budgetary control of our state budget, given the amount of money we spend on education, to a lifetime unelected person. I do not think that's a wise idea. It's not because we don't need to do something. And as Representative Messier pointed out, Massachusetts, it was actually the legislature finally that acted. This legislature and our governor, whoever that happens to be at a given time, needs to do something to fix our public education system. But this is not it, in my opinion, all, all due respect. I do not want to put budgetary tax decisions into the hands of an unelected lifetime appointed judge, and this will exactly do that. Are there any other questions from the members? Okay, seeing none, I believe our first witness up is Secretary of State Nelly Gorbea. Are you there, Madam Secretary? Yes, Mr. Chairman, how are you? Oh, I got a promotion. Um, I'm just helping out uh, second, First oh, Vice wait. Chair Messier. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. It, that's the problem with doing things over the phone, actually. It's, it's okay. Um, and, and not seeing what you're doing. It's, you're, you're, you're flying blind. Anyway, um, thank you uh, to, to all the members of the committee um, for the opportunity to speak in support of the House bill. Is this, um, can I go forward? Yes, please. Okay, yes. So I'm here to speak in support of House Bill 5421. And I know that this is not the first time this has been discussed at the General Assembly, so I want to especially thank Representative Messier for continuing to introduce this important legislation that would allow voters to prioritize the right to a public education in our state constitution. Now, I have been uh, a resident of Rhode Island now for 30 years, and so I've witnessed over those past 30 years countless of conversations and reports about improving our state public education system. The reports have challenged us to address both academic offerings and physical conditions. After a crippling moratorium on school construction, Governor Raimondo and this General Assembly, uh, with support of Rhode Island voters, finally started to address the deteriorated condition of our school building. But conversations about the academic and social achievement have continued, and, and they've taken a particularly anxious tone, as we've seen over those 30 years. Two of our urban centers, Central Falls and Providence, go through takeover processes by the state, along with reports that show us lagging in comparison to our state's neighbors. Now, most recently, even our own children have mobilized to sue the state for its inability to provide them with education needed to be fully engaged citizens. Over those same 30 years, our world has continued to evolve in a way that makes education uh, absolutely essential to one's ability to earn a living. Whether we like it or not, technological advances have been making a right to an education critical. So whether you own a small business, you work in a lab, you fix cars, or you build homes, you will do better in this very much technologically oriented society if you are educated. The educational achievement of Rhode Islanders is directly tied to our ability to grow our economy. And that's not just me saying it. I mean, a number of economic studies have said that. And most recently, I heard a uh, Bryant University professor, Elinaldo Tevaldi, do a really great job of talking about how um, 
you know, Rhode Island has a capital investment problem in that it's, it, it, it lacks enough investment in its key resource, which is its people. Increasing our state's economic productivity is directly tied to our investment in our most important asset, Rhode Islanders. Uh, the pandemic has further highlighted many of the disparities in public education for students and communities across the state. So I want to make sure that I say that this is not an urban versus suburban problem. I think it's a problem statewide. And as we look ahead to our post-pandemic society, this is the time to present voters with the choice of whether Rhode Islanders should have a right to a public education. I believe if asked, Rhode Islanders will say that our children should have this right because we want our children to succeed in this brave new world. This right to an education is one that should be clearly articulated in our Constitution. And including this right in the Constitution will bring needed focus and commitment to ensuring all of our students have the ability to succeed in a rapidly changing world where knowledge is power and economic ability. Um, now, since I've was secretary, since I was elected Secretary of State, I've made civics education a priority of this office. And in fact, uh, we applied the resources of the Department of State so that they are more easily available to teachers, homeschooling parents, and students. Uh, we've got a dedicated staff person uh, who's developed curriculum and tools for educators to teach the importance of government uh, and, and civic education in our schools. And in many school districts, there is a need to have a more robust civic education curriculum uh, along with other areas. Um, but all students should have the same opportunities to learn about their government and the rights and freedoms we enjoy in this country. As a passionate supporter of this civics education, it was really inspiring to see so many young people engaged over the last several years, and particularly in raising their voices to advocate for change. Now, ultimately, the court ruled against them, not because the court thought they were wrong in their complaint, but because we have not enshrined the right to vote as a constitutional right, I'm mean, sorry, the right to an education as a constitutional right in Rhode Island. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me restate that so I can be clear. Uh, you know, the court didn't think that they were wrong in their complaint. But because uh, we have not enshrined the right to an education as a constitutional right in Rhode Island, he was not able to rule in their favor. So passing House Bill 5421 is the first step in prioritizing public education in Rhode Island. Let's give voters of Rhode Island the opportunity to give us direction. I'm a big supporter of that. Uh, let's have the opportunity to come together to support our children and our economic future by making education a right. Thank you uh, for your time this afternoon, and I um, enthusiastically ask you for your support of this important legislation. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for your uh, testimony today. Do any of the members of the committee have any input for the Secretary? Seeing none. Oh, Representative McGaw. I just, I just want to um, Thank, um, thank the representative for bringing this forward. Um, I think uh, um, education needs to be a right for our children. And when I first learned that it was not, I was actually stunned. Um, very appreciative that they have made this um, a constitutional right in Massachusetts. And um, I, I want to thank her again for bringing this forward. I think it's really important. Uh, thank you, Representative. Um, with that, and seeing no other hands, uh, we're going to ask for the next caller, which would be Paige Clausius Parks. Is that person on the line? That person is from uh, Rhode Island Kids Count and signed up in support. Um, Paige, you're on the air. Can you hear me? Paige? Hello, Paige? Yes. Are you on the line? I am on the line. Okay, you are on the air uh, to testify in support of this bill. I just ask that given the um, hour and the number of witnesses we have, will you limit your testimony to just a couple of min minutes if you can? Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Um, I have provided written testimony as well, so I will keep my comments brief. Um, Rhode Island Kids Count is in support of House Bill 5421. We strongly believe that all children in Rhode Island 
deserve access to a high quality public education from pre-K through college. And the quality of the education a child receives should not depend on their zip code or the city in which they live. And we recognize that Rhode Island has taken many steps to try to ensure that children have a high quality education. One of those steps has been um, creating the funding formula in which equity and adequacy were two of the key principles of the formula. The formula was then improved again to provide additional funds for multilingual learners, but we know there is still more work to be done with our education funding formula. Uh, the basic education plan, also called the BEP, was developed, again, with the goal of setting basic standards to ensure a high quality education for all students. But despite all of that work and all those efforts, we still see persistent and unacceptable inequities especially in school districts that serve high numbers of low-income students, students of color, and multilingual learners. And we believe this bill will help to close existing opportunity and resource gaps. So thank you so much for the opportunity to provide testimony today. We hope you um, pass this bill. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Paige. Does anyone have any questions? Seeing none. Um, Thank you for your testimony. And we'll move on to our next witness, who is uh, Patrick Crowley um, from NEARI, who signed up in support. Is he online? Patrick? Yes. Hi, Patrick. It's uh, Jason Knight. And um, welcome to the committee. Uh, you're signed up in support of Bill 5421, and you have the floor. I just ask that you keep your testimony to a couple minutes, given the hour and the number of witnesses that we have. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your time. Patrick Crowley on behalf of the 12,000 members of NEA Rhode Island. Uh, let me just say very briefly that we are in strong support of this piece of legislation. We think it's an important measure to, to take at this time, and we think it complements the strong advocacy on behalf of public education that the General Assembly has taken over the last several years and that's why we think this is the very next step that we need to take to continue on a path towards a better public education system in Rhode Island. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, that is uh, succinct, Patrick. Thank you. Any questions for Patrick? Seeing none. Um, thank you, Patrick, for your testimony. Uh, really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our next witness is Steve Brown from the ACLU, who signed up in support. And uh, is he online? Steve? Yep. You're online. You're good to go to testify in support of 5421. Uh, just ask that you keep it uh, short given the hour and the number of witnesses. Absolutely. I will be short. Uh, the ACLU strongly supports uh, this proposed constitutional amendment. Um, what you've heard from a number of people is that the courts have been very clear. Um, there have been three courts that have said uh, there's no constitutional right, and they said it's up to the General Assembly. And we hope the General Assembly will take up the offer and pass this. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Steve? Seeing none, then um, we will move on. Our next witness is Galen Hour. Uh, if Mr. Hour is on the line, I hope I heard that. Uh, I hope I said that correctly. Galen, are you online? Yes. Hello. Hi, Galen. Um, um, I hang on. Hang on there. Uh, you're from the Al Al what uh, organization? Yes, so I'm calling on behalf of the Alliance of Rhode Island Southeast Asians for Education, also known as ARISE. Um, and um, we did submit written testimony as well, so I will keep this brief. Um, I want to do two things. One, I want to share the testimony of my colleague, Laurel Butler, who um, wasn't able to submit his testimony verbally um, due to the length of this, this hearing, actually. Um, but uh, we, we strongly support passage of House Bill uh, 5421 uh, to give Rhode Islanders the chance to enshrine the right to an education in our state's constitution. Um, we have done work on the Cook v. Raimondo litigation um, that was mentioned by the Secretary of State earlier, um, which would, uh, it's part of a fight for a constitutional right to a civics education. And um, uh, my colleague Laurel said, um, you know, education should be within the Constitution because it would benefit, benefit the state by making sure all Rhode Islanders are educated to a certain level. Almost 20% of our state is living in poverty, and the youth who are included in that statistic wouldn't be able to get the extra 
extra help that they need without a, an education that prepares them to exercise their civil rights and empowers them to achieve, you know, not only financial stability, but also personal success and fulfillment. Um, oftentimes within the school system, students who are ahead get the help they need more than those who aren't doing it as well. And, um, you know, with a system that conforms to the needs of others, um, you know, it would increase the amount of educated people in our state, and that would work best for everyone. Um, the fact that this would make it, um, you know, an enforceable constitutional right is a critical piece of this legislation to us um, because we think that students deserve that recourse. And I just want to finish by briefly responding to Representative Newberry's remark um, about the uh, potential budget concerns that could arise. Um, I'm not a budgetary specialist. I'm not an economist or a lawyer, but as a resident of the state and as an advocate of social justice, it seems to me that the fact that a constitutional amendment may raise financial or budgetary challenges, um, you know, should not in itself be used to justify uh, the denial of that amendment. You know, the amendments in both our state and national constitutions which prohibit the practice of slavery also raised financial and budgetary challenges for the legislators of that time. And while I realize that may seem to be an extreme example, we're also talking about the same uh, issue here. Uh, we're talking about ensuring equality in all, you know, in the right to education for all residents of Rhode Island. Um, and I think that that should really take priority um, over, over the concerns that I understand are real concerns that Representative Newberry voiced. Um, with that, thank you very much uh, for your time, and we urge the passage of this legislation. Thank you, Galen, and thank you for um, uh, giving us uh, Law Rail's perspective as well. Um, next on the list is Randall Rose, who is uh, signed up in support. Is he online? Randall? Yes. Hi, Randall. It's uh, Jason Knight. You're on the air in support of 5421. I just ask that you uh, keep it to just a couple of minutes, given the hour and the number of witnesses that we have. Yes, I understand. Thank you very much. Um, and um, so I am, like other people, I am in favor of this bill. Um, I think it's, um, it's important, um, not um, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, because it's um, very important in uh, making sure that people are treated, that people, no matter what their background, um, children have an, a chance that they had a good education. Um, that's um, um, giving everybody a chance in our society should start um, at the beginning. And um, also, even apart from that, it's a very good investment. Um, I, um, I know that um, the General Assembly has a lot of issues to deal with, but um, public education is absolutely important to our future. It's important to make sure that everyone has an adequate education that it permits them to achieve at high levels, and putting this in the Constitution and making it enforceable um, helps to remind the General Assembly that this is important and will create incentives going forward to really invest in our future and um, put Rhode Island in a much better place when we have more educated Rhode Islanders. So I'm um, very strongly in support of this bill. Thank you. Um, and um, please allow it to go to the voters because I think it will be very popular um, when it gets on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Any questions for Randall? Okay, Randall, thank you very much. Uh, next in line to testify in support of this bill is uh, Tim Duffy. Tim, Tim, if you could uh, uh, identify your organization uh, and um, keep it uh, short, given the hour and the number of witnesses, please. Yeah, I'll try to keep it short. Go ahead. Hello? Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Um, my name is Tim Duffy. I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Association of School Committees. I want to thank Representative Messier for submitting this bill on our behalf. Um, this is something that we've been pursuing for over the last 10 years. Uh, the legislation before you is predicated on the fact, is, is boosted by the fact that Massachusetts in 1993 found that education was a fundamental right for all students. Um, in 1995, our Supreme Court uh, did not find that education was a constitutional right under uh, the interpretation of Article 12. Um, so we have struggled along, kicked the can down the road, 
had a mediocre education system, while well, Massachusetts has progressed to um, a, a, a system that is apparently the, the best nationally and compares favorably on international assessments like STEM and PISA. It's also been an economic driver for this uh, state of uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So, you know, what we're looking at is uh, a two states side by side that have taken different paths going forward. One has been mired in mediocrity and the other has succeeded. I think there's nothing more important uh, than having education as a fundamental constitutional right in Rhode Island. And that's why we propose this legislation. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions of the committee. Is there any questions from uh, the members of the committee? I have one. Go ahead, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Duffy, uh, you presented this to the courts prior, and what was the outcome? Well, there have been two cases of the Tucker Moonsocket filed suit in 1994 after the Supreme Court decision in Massachusetts. Uh, they won, they prevailed at the Superior Court level. Justice Needham finding that uh, education was a constitutionally protected right. Um, in overturning that, Judge uh, Vicki Letterberg, who was uh, writing for the majority of the court, uh, actually for the entire court, said that the Constitution did not afford an adequate, meaningful, or equitable education. In 2006, Pawtucket and Woonsocket again filed a suit in Superior Court. It made its way to the state Supreme Court. And even though Judge Sattel commented about the deplorable conditions in both those communities, they non nonetheless upheld their earlier ruling. Uh, thank you, Mr. Duffy. And uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I'm sir. in full support of this bill. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and thank you, Tim. Does anyone else have anything for Tim? Tim, thank you for your um, outstanding advocacy on this bill. Thank you. Our next caller is uh, Samia Nash, a senior at Classical High School, who is signed up in favor of the bill. Samia, are you on? Yes, I am. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, you are. Outstanding. Uh, go ahead. You are on the air. Um, please tell us what you think of the bill. Just uh, keep it to two or three minutes, uh, given the hour. All right, thank you. Uh, members of the House Committee and the State Government Elections, my name is Samia Nash, and I am a senior at Classical High School and a youth organizer for a rise. I am testifying today in support of House Bill 5421 to have the right to have adequate education inserted in the Rhode Island Constitution. Many times I have asked myself if the information I am learning is going to benefit me in the future. I want to learn about how to file my taxes, how to register to vote, know what qualifies me to buy a house, how to budget, how to effectively run a campaign for a position in our government, and many other things that I will need to have when I leave school grounds. The things I am actually learning are things for temporary means, such as standardized testing and my grade point average. I would rather be tested on the concept I need for survival so that if in any case I do not do well on these subjects, I can be tutored and taught how to effectively and accurately perform these tasks correctly in the future. In my history courses, I was often the token student whenever the subject revolves around the history of black people or the concept of living as a black individual. The teacher would rely on my good judgment to prove the information they were teaching the class was as if it was, inf um, as if it was accurate as I knew every single detail about the history of our ancestors. I have also seen Asian, Hispanic, and Native American students become token students as well, speak on the perspective of being an individual of the minority race, as if their experiences were shared among all Asian, Hispanic, and Native American people. If our education system has to rely on students to teach their peers and not have eligible educators to take on the responsibility to do their own research on our history, then this is a serious problem that needs improving. We need to hold our education system legally accountable for the job they are supposed to be doing and making sure the education these students are gaining is tailored to them. 
As important it is to have the right to bear arms, right to assembly, and the freedom to religion, it should be on our agenda to have the right to adequate education so that we as students are able to have equal opportunities and have the ability to make our own personal and educated decisions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samia, for your testimony. Does anybody have any questions for Samia? Seeing none from the board. Um, thank you for your time and your excellent testimony. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, that concludes thank you. the uh, the live testimony on this bill. We have written testimony, all in favor, from uh, Tim Duffy from the Rhode Island Association of School Committees, uh, Rhode Island Kids Count, uh, Jordan Godet, excuse me, Goyette, Morgan Hour, Galen Hour. Abigail Lee of Arise and Samia Nash, who just spoke of Arise, and Morgan and Galen, excuse me, Galen is also from Arise, uh, which is the Alliance of Rhode Island Southeast Asians. And that concludes the testimony on Bill 5421 from First Vice Chair Messier. Um, moving on, do we have uh, Chair Williams? Ba, 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 ba. Eight. And good evening, Chair. How are you? Good evening. I wish I could say as good as you, but you know, I am still alive and grateful, and I was going to say privileged, but um, I am blessed okay let me uh, go ahead and put um, your two bills into play and then uh, invite you to introduce them uh, the first one is uh, bill 5285 it's an act relating to election well, hold on if I may I would prefer to do 5290 first all right well let me let me get them both in play and then you take them as you see them okay uh, so we'll do uh, 5290 which is an act relating to state affairs and government um, state police and diversity it mandates that 40 percent of new police recruits be persons of color um, and bill 5285 uh, by chair williams which is an act relating to elections and the residents of those in government custody that means in prison uh, and we require that the state use the actual residences of persons in government custody for the census and redistricting purposes and the such information would be determined by the Department of Correction and the Secretary of State and forwarded to the United States Census Bureau. And uh, Chair Williams, take it away. Thank you. 5290 State Police Minority Recruitment. This act would also require the superintendent to conduct a vigorous effort to recruit persons of color to the Rhode Island State Police Training Academy. The superintendent would utilize all forms of media in this recruitment effort, including but not limited to print, electronic media, radio, and television. The recruitment effort shall include dissemination of information relating to the selection and training process for admission to the Rhode Island State Police Training Academy. This act would require that beginning June 30th, 2021, at least two in every five recruits to this Rhode Island State Police Training Academy be a person of color. Beginning June 30th, 2022, at least two in every five new appointments to the Rhode Island State Police be a person of color. This bill is needed because the ranks of the state police should reflect the diversity of the community which it serves and this legislation will go a long way in rectifying the lack of diversity within Rhode Island State Police that we have experienced since the agency's inception. Now, I want to say that in as much as it's, it's been said that diversity comes at a slow pace, it's been so slow that I have to come before this committee in this building in order to revive it, present it, remind, because while it's slow, the efforts are not really being made. Yes, you may hear from the rank and file of the state police that, you know, we have created this position, we have brought on, we have 
uh, um, promoted individuals of color, first and foremost, you don't have enough qualified people of color on there. The person who was in charge of this particular department is no longer in charge of this department, which was a person of color, and instead was moved out of that position, and a white man was put in that position in order to recruit diversity. Hmm. Well, while I know and believe that you don't have to be a person of color to recruit qualified or identify qualified or interview qualified individuals of color, it just lacks because most of those individuals do not come into our neighborhood or the nick of the woods without someone that looked like us, first and foremost. So we need to cut out the, I know a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend. We need to stop this, well my father was a trooper, my cousin is a trooper, my nephew is a trooper, my wife, my mistress, my boyfriend, and all that is a trooper from the same immediate circle. Those individuals have the heads up to getting in, the heads up on the test, the heads up on the training, the heads up from a person who is coming in trying to achieve the opportunity of protecting and serving in that elite law enforcement agency. So I'm saying it again, even though it's just for you here, I'm saying it again, and whoever else is online, I'm saying it again, and I'm going to continue to say it till it's fixed. Because I've been saying this, my grandparents were saying it, and it, I hope that my grandchildren are not going to be coming and looking at you all, some of you is looking down at your papers instead of paying attention to what I have to say. But nevertheless, if they have to come before this body and make it known that our lives matter, not just when it's convenient for you, but when we qualify for the positions and everything else that we apply for. And with that, I will answer any questions. Are there any questions by members of the committee on 5290 for Chair Williams? Seeing none, uh, Chair Williams, there are no um, witnesses signed up for live testimony or written, uh, so I think you can go on to 5285. Thank you. 5285, this act would require that persons in government custody use their actual residence for census and redistricting purposes. Such information will be determined by the Department of Corrections and the Secretary of State and forwarded to the United States Census Bureau. Even though it is in our general laws that a person's domicile for the purposes of census taking and redistricting cannot be lost due to absence if defined in a correctional facility, the census classifies incarcerated persons as a resident of their places of incarceration rather than their home addresses. To address this issue, this legislation would direct the Department of Corrections to compile the data of its prisoner's last known address and forward that information to the Secretary of State and the United States Census Bureau for the purpose of a redistricting legislative districts. This legislation is important to acquire accurate information when legislative districts are redrawn every 10 years. Although this legislation has practical concerns in how our legislative districts are determined, this bill is more importantly about individuals' humanity and how we classify them if they happen to be incarcerated. Just because a person is in jail does not erase who they are and where they came from. The only way to tr truly rehabil re rehabilitate these individuals is to treat them like human beings and this legislation is just one piece of that much larger puzzle in how to reform our justice system. Again, see us when you need us, use us when you can, and then discard us. Being able to be counted where we rightfully live opposed to being counted in someone else's um, district for financial purposes is totally wrong 
And with that, I'm open for any questions, if there are any. Uh, Representative Newberry, you have a question. Yeah, just very quickly. I, I remember this issue came up 10 years ago, too. I mean, I agree with this bill completely. I just didn't know, is there anything in the U.S., the federal regulations that directs prisoners to be counted wherever they're imprisoned, or is that, or do we just do it in Rhode Island, because that's what we do? We need to do it here, and the only reason it was being held back is because you know who didn't want it to happen, and you know who, <laughs> where he's at now, so. so well, I was going to say, yeah, I know why, but, <laughs> but I mean, but this is something in our control? That's my question. Yes. Okay. Yes. Does anyone else have any questions for Chair Williams? Bring it, baby. Come on. Well, I think now we have some people lined up um, to provide live testimony, starting with Nick Horton from Open Doors, who is in support of the bill. Yeah, I don't Nick, you there? Hello? Nick, it's uh, Jason Knight from the um, Government and Elections Committee. You are on live on the air to testify in support of uh, 5285. Uh, I just ask that you uh, keep it brief given the hour and the number of witnesses that we have. Thank you, Chairman Knight. Thank you to the committee and thank you, Representative Williams, for sponsoring this legislation. Uh, my name is Nick Corden. I'm the co-executive director for Open Doors, an agency that provides services and advocacy to people that have been in prison. Um, in 2006, we ran a statewide campaign to return the right to vote to thousands of people on probation and parole. So we see this legislation as a continuation of the fight for equi equitable political representation. Uh, I want to point out that I, this legislation is not about pitting one community versus, versus another. It's about strengthening our democracy. Uh, we've seen over the past several years examples of extreme gerrymandering that can uh, Dis distort democracy. For example, a state like Wisconsin, where uh, uh, part, the Republican Party can win a close to a supermajority of House seats, even with a minority of the vote. Cases like that indicate the dangers of the ways that gerrymandering can uh, manipulate our system. And in Rhode Island, we saw really a, a, a an amazing an, a, a example of this, emphasized in State District 15. Uh, which was won by very small margins over the last several elections uh, in 2016 by less than 100 votes. Um, and those tiny margins had a huge impact on the political power of our state. It determined the Speaker of the House. District 15 was drawn in such a way that it included about 1,000 residents from the ACI. Uh, thus, about 8% of the district was incarcerated could not vote and was politically non-existent for the purposes of those elections. Had the district been drawn to include only actual constituents, only actual community members of Cranston, the outcome may have been different. And the Speaker of the House may have been different and years of Rhode Island politics may have been different. I'm not trying to make a judgment about those outcomes, only to say that in, in situations of such import, we clearly want the decisions to rest on as strong a democratic foundation as possible. But instead, what we have is extremely flawed. It's very possible within our laws that at some point you could have a house district that included all the ACI and 6,000 people there and would be 43 and 43 percent of the district would be disenfranchised. Uh, that is not impossible based on our current system and would clearly be uh, in opposition to the democratic system that we want. Uh, and one last thing I want to make sure everyone understands is that uh, although the principles here are very important, the actual numbers are relatively small. In, in 2020, in April, there were only about 2,000 people in prison. So we're talking about a small number of people, um, how they would be counted in the Cranston districts, and even smaller number of people as they would be rearranged in the communities they came from. And lastly, this, this bill has not, would have no impact on uh, any direct apportionment of finances to these districts it is only indicate it only relates to the drawing of the uh, district boundaries um so it, it uh i believe it's an issue that would should join us all instead of divide us and i hope um we'll have your support uh thank you nick um does anyone have any questions for nick seeing none uh thanks for your testimony and we'll move on to the next witness um thank you that would be michael adams is he online? Michael? Michael? Hello? Uh, you want to try him again or should we move on? 
gentleman. Michael? Yes. Hi, uh, Michael. This is uh, uh, Jason Knight with the um, Committee on Elections and Government, and uh, you're on the air to testify uh, in favor of Bill 5285. The floor is yours. I just ask that you uh, keep it tight, given the hour and the yeah. number of witnesses. Yes. Go ahead. Good evening, Chairman Shanley and honorable members of the committee. My name is Michael Adams. I have been a resident of the Silver, Silver Lake neighborhood of Providence for all my life. Before this year, I was never aware of the impacts of prison-based gerrymandering on Rhode Island state politics. But since learning more about it, I wanted to tell you how I feel. As soon as, as, as someone who is formerly incarcerated and as a lifelong resident of Providence, I am frustrated because it feels like the urban community has been defrauded out of the basic rights to equal representation. From a young age, my parents taught me the importance of voting and how our local representatives are supposed to honor and respect the need of our citizens. So I always make sure to vote for people that will do the right thing. But when I vote, that vote isn't just for me. Each time I choose someone to represent us, I'm, I'm also voting with my family, my friends, and future generations in mind. I am voting with the people I know that are in prisons in mind. So many of the people I grew up with, I'm voting, remembering what it was like to be in prison myself. Learning about the law just gives me another reason to remember how important my vote is. When I couldn't vote anymore, that really upset me. When I got back to voting, I made sure to use it. I made sure to learn about the local races I was voting on too. I know there's a lot of ways America tells me over and over again that I don't matter like the prison gerrymandering laws, but I do matter and my voice does matter and that's why I'm here talking to you today. Voting is, is the one concrete way that average people like me can advocate for positive change in the lives of people we care about. My friends and I are very active in the community, volunteering our time, helping others because we understand the destructive cycles that persist here, but volunteering can only do so much. Voting allows me to have a say in choosing representatives of the people each and every one of you should want as your constituent to feel equally heard in this same way. I urge all of you to commit to this small step to, to the right um, imbalances of our democracy. Democracy, democracy. Thank you so much. Michael, thank, thank you very you much. Members, thank you, committee members, for your um, for your time, and thank you, Representative Williams, for introducing this bill. Thank you, Michael, for your advocacy. Does anyone have any questions for Michael? Um, seeing none from the committee, thanks, for, Michael. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, our next wit witness is Angel, and I hope I say this right, Turbides. Um, Angel, are you there? Yes, I am. Angel, it says here that you're a member of the Board of Open Doors. Is that correct? Yes. All right. The floor is yours to testify in favor of uh, 5285. And I uh, just ask that you uh, keep it tight, given the hour and the number of witnesses. Okay, I will. Thank you. Um, growing up in Providence as an immigrant from Puerto Rico, I've seen how the same problems within low-income urban communities persist throughout generations. I come from a family where voting was not a high priority. Our biggest concern was to make enough money to survive. I wasn't taught the importance of voting or how to research candidates and decide which one would best serve my community or fix the problems I saw around me. And when I spent time in the ACI, I found that the same was true for many men there. <clears throat> Most of the men I met at the ACI when I was there five years ago were from low-income neighborhoods within Providence and Pawtucket. Now, five years later, through my work as a board member at Open Doors, where formerly incarcerated people receive reentry services, I can see that this same pattern continues still. Most people in prison keep in contact with their friends and family while inside. And when they get out, they go back to those same places. That's what I did. Upon release from prison, people like me are then returning to places like that again and again, and are denied equal political voice. So even after we recognize our needs upon our return home, our community still has a fair say in choosing leaders who will address those needs. I was lucky to receive the social services 
But I needed in order to transition back into society and find a job after my stay at the ACI. But I know a lot of people who aren't as lucky. Maybe if my community had a fair say, we wouldn't be denied the help we need. Prison-based gerrymandering weakens the voice of communities that already struggle with high rates of incarcerated non-voters and a lack of civic participation. It's one more barrier on top of all the other barriers. Voter suppression laws that make it harder for people to vote, a public school system that's falling apart in poverty. I have come to see how together these forces all combine to work against my community in multiple ways. Still right now, I feel more hopeful than ever that change is on the way. Civic participation among people like me in Rhode Island is finally strengthened. People like me are seeking to make our voices heard. As this shift occurs, I want to know that my vote and the votes of my peers matter equal. And I can tell you for sure that the current law doesn't make any sense. When I was in prison, I did not feel as a part of the Cranston community. And I definitely did not feel represented by any politicians from Cranston. Passing this bill is the perfect next step because it evens out the playing field for everyone. It's not about Cranston versus Providence or Pawtucket. It's about making sure that all of Rhode Island has the democracy it deserves. If you're a legislator who does not represent a community that has a lot of people going to prison, you should still want to see this bill succeed. All of Rhode Island's representatives and senators should support the principle of equal political representation. And this bill can help finally make that a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angel, for your uh, testimony. Does anyone have any questions for Angel? Seeing none, Angel, thank you for your time. Thank you. And moving on, our next witness on uh, this bill is John Marion from Common Cause Rhode Island. John, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, John, the floor is yours. Um, just keep it, uh, keep it succinct, please. Yes, I will be very uh, short. Um, I'm just here to express our strong support. Um, we uh, supported this bill for uh, many years. Um, uh, this, I just want to emphasize, this is the year to pass this because later this year, the General Assembly will uh, begin the process of redistricting. And there is a delay in the, the data delivery from the Census Bureau. Um, it probably won't be uh, delivered to the state until September. So there is time to pass this uh, and to prepare uh, to do this. I don't know if any other witnesses answered Representative Newberry's question, but this does not cause problems um, uh, with any federal law. In fact, the Census Bureau uh, in the last de decade uh, has agreed basically to accommodate advocates of this by delivering the census data um, with prisons um, noted in the file. Uh, so. Uh, this is uh, doable. Um, it has passed the Senate on multiple occasions, uh, and as the sponsor uh, mentioned, uh, hasn't passed the House. Um, so now is the time, uh, we think, for the House to take this up uh, so that uh, these adjustments can be made um, prior uh, to the next cycle of redistricting that is uh, quickly upon us. I'll finish there and happy to take questions. Does anyone have any questions for I do. I do. Go uh, ahead, Chairman. Uh, Chairman. Go ahead. Ms. Uh, you, you talked about doable. Could you expand on doable? Sure. So the um, what's going to have to happen here, uh, and the folks from the Prison Policy Initiative know this better than I do, but the, the Census Bureau will deliver a uh, data file to the state. Um, uh, and. Uh, as I said, it's probably going to be about September 30th. Um, right now, we would, if this doesn't pass, we will just um, draw new districts based on that data file. Uh, if this were to pass, the um, the consultant that the JCLS hires to do the redistricting would simply have to um, get from the Department of Corrections a file of the last known home address of the folks who were incarcerated on April 1st, 2020, which was Census Day, and reallocate them uh, to uh, the communities from which um, which they resided um, uh, prior to incarceration. Um, and so they, they would just re, they would essentially be moving the folks who are at the ACI to their last known 
home address, uh, and then the maps would be drawn off of uh, the new um, the new data. Thank you. I needed that to be explained. Thank you, Mr. Okay, I'm happy to talk offline more about it if you'd like. Thank you, sir. Does anyone else have any questions for John? And John, just before you leave, I just want to note for the record that um, Chairman Corvasi is present. Uh, Chair, would you like to have your votes recorded, please? Regarding uh, hold for further study? Yes. Yes. Uh, Chairman Corvasi votes in the affirmative on hold for further study. And do you have any questions? It's 5285, prison redistricting. Do you have any questions for John? Uh, no, I will probably talk to the, to the sponsor at some point. All right. John, thank you very much for your testimony. I really appreciate it. And um, if thank no you. one else has any questions for him, we'll move on to the next witness. And our next witness is Alex Kajstura from the Prison Policy Initiative. Did I say that right? Uh, yes. All right. Score two for me. Um, Alex, you have signed up in support of 5285. The floor is yours to testify. And uh, I just ask that you keep it uh, succinct given the hour and the number of witnesses. Will do. Thank you very much. Thank so I'll you. jump to the questions that have been presented already, whether this is about whether we can do this um, based on the federal regulations. And uh, yes, as some folks have pointed out, this is done on the state side and that data remains state side. Um, based on the Census Bureau's own interpretation of their own internal residence rules. Um, incarcerated people are counted at the location of the correctional facility, and that will continue until the Census Bureau uh, reinterprets their rules. Uh, what the Census Bureau is doing this decade is helping states out do these, is helping states out doing these sorts of adjustments. Um, so we're going to have, um, right now, nine states are slated to do this adjustment this decade. Um, and the Bureau will help states out in two ways. One, it will publish in the redistricting files that are usually sent to states, there'll be a separate table that lists all the correctional facilities so that states can actually uh, pinpoint in the data where the correctional populations were counted in the first place, which is new this time around. Usually that's hidden um, in the census data. And two um, is part of the process of doing the adjustment um, that John described, which is the state takes the data file from the Census Bureau. It then takes the data from the Department of Corrections that has everybody's home addresses. Those home addresses will come in a format that's like 123 Main Street rather than a geographic location that you can pin on a map. So that needs to get what's called geocoded so that basically mapped out, the Census Bureau will run those addresses through its own geocoder, so it will match the census data the way the census data is geocoded. So basically, you'll have an apples to apples comparison of um, where on a map a place is, and the state can just do um, a quick adjustment based on those two data sets, and then that is how the state produces its new redistricting data. Um, this is data that's only used for redistricting, the files used for funding sources, the files that stay at the Census Bureau, the files that go to any other states will remain in those states. You can think of it as um, each file is its own separate copy and whatever edits you make to this file to make it appropriate for use in redistricting to make sure that everybody gets counted as a constituent of their own representative um, will stay just for that purpose. And I'm happy to answer any questions now or offline as to the particulars and how implementation went in other states and anything else. Does anyone have any questions for Alex? Uh, seeing none from the committee, Alex, I just have one. How, um, if you know, uh, how does the prison go about finding the original address for the inmate? Is that self-reported? You, you seem to know a lot about the process. I'm wondering if you know that. Sure. Um, it depends on the state. I believe it's um, taken up upon intake. Um, and I think Rhode Island has a good portion of the addresses. No state has a complete database, um, and so what states are doing and what New York and Maryland did last decade when they already passed these laws and implemented them is basically do, um, you just do the best you can with the data you have and try to improve things going forward. So in this bill, for example, um, we actually have a data collection mechanism starting next year so that for this redistricting cycle, you do the best you can with the data you have on hand 
and then going forward, there's a mechanism for collecting which data needs to be collected so it's most compatible with the census data. Thank you, Alex. Much appreciated. Um, thank you for your time and thank you for your testimony. No problem. Thank you very much. Next, we have Stephen Brown for his next appearance before the committee. Uh, Steve, you're on the air. Uh, testifying in favor of 5285, Stephen Brown from the ACLU. Are you there, Steve? Is that it? Is he on, Steve? I am. All uh, right. You're on the air in favor of 5285. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, the ACLU is strongly in favor of this bill. Uh, I think you've heard some uh, some great testimony uh, tonight as to why this bill is important in terms of furthering the basic principle of one person, one vote. Uh, we've submitted written testimony in support of it as well. Um, this really is the year to do it with redistricting coming up, and we hope that uh, the committee will look favorably upon it as the Senate has done in the past. Uh, we, we really urge a passage this year. It will help a lot of people. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Brown? Seeing none from the committee, uh, Steve, thanks for your testimony. And, Thank um, you. Good night. Good night. And uh, a last person testifying in favor of this is Randall Rose in favor of 5285. Randall, you on? Randall? Yes. Hey. Yes. It's uh, Jason Knight from the Committee on Elections and Government. You're on the air testifying in favor of 5285, and I just ask that you keep it tight given the hour. Sure, thank you. Yes, um, the delay is quite long here, but uh, okay. Um, so I am also in favor of the bill. Um, it's um, just um, they bill to implement the state constitution's rule that about one person, one vote, that um, a person's should be counted as residing at their um, actual um, regular home address um, and um, not um, and um, that redistricting should not um, consider a person's address to be um, in um, the ACI or other correctional facility. That's all in the state constitution. This bill is just to implement that. Um, it's, um, it's a good bill that makes sure that all regions of Rhode Island are counted equally on a one-person, one-vote basis, um, and I would be glad to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Um, appreciate your time. Does anyone have any questions for Randall? Seeing none, Randall, thank you. Uh, I just want to note uh, that we have some written testimony as well. Uh, the Rhode Island ACLU, which we just heard from, is written in favor, along with uh, Jordan Goyette, is also in favor. Open Doors uh, has submitted written testimony as well in favor, as well as the Prison Policy Initiative. And then uh, Common Cause uh, by John Marion is also written in, in favor. Seeing no other witnesses, that will conclude our hearing on Bill 5285. And the last bill of the evening is Bill 5422 by uh, Leader Filippi, who is not available, uh, so I will just put it in play. Um, 5422 is a bill, an act relating to elections, uh, the Rhode Island Campaign Contributions and Expenditures Reporting. It requires not, oh, I think we already put this in play, but I'll double, I'll just do it double just to make sure. It requires nonprofit entities and candidates comply with reporting requirements for transportation and other amenities provided to any candidate. It prohibits nonprofit, a nonprofit owned by a candidate to provide any other candidate such amenities. Um, like I said, this Leader Filippi's bill, uh, there's no one signed up to testify in favor or against, and there is no written testimony in favor or against. If anyone from the committee wants to say anything about this bill, seeing none, uh, that will conclude our testimony on 5422, which I believe concludes our bills for the evening. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Uh, Rep. Newberry makes a motion to adjourn. Uh, Chair Corbasi seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 And the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night, folks.